Okay, good evening again, everybody. Thank you for joining us. My name is Scott Kleinrock. I'm the Conservation Programs Manager at the WaterWise Community Center. And you are joining us this evening for our Landscape Transformation Basics class. We do a lot of online workshops and education. And so tonight is really our kind of introductory class. Uh, consider it a crash course that includes a little bit of content we cover in more in-depth topic specific classes. And it's really a basics of what you need to know and should be thinking about before you jump in to a landscape transformation or a landscape renovation topic. We're located in Southern California. So this will be kind of with a lens towards doing this in Southern California, though much of the information will be useful to people elsewhere. And I'll tell you just a little bit about who I am and why I'm talking to you about this. My name is Scott Kleinrock. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, I'm the Conservation Programs Manager at the WaterWise Community Center. And I have been working in the landscape industry for uh, quite a few years. And, and for the last uh, 15, 16 years, I've been very obsessed specifically with trying to understand the urban and suburban landscape. The typical uh, was built somewhere between the 1940s and now uh, kind of unused patches of lawn in the front yard and in the backyard and trying to understand how we can do it better, uh, how we can use less resources while having much more inspiring landscapes to live in that do much more for us. I've worked doing horticulture, uh, have a master's degree in landscape architecture and worked doing landscape design, uh, construction management and project management in the public garden world before I shifted to my role at the WaterWise Community Center. And really my passion is working with homeowners who are trying to figure out uh, what they want to do and whether it's doing the work themselves or working with a contractor, really helping people set themselves up for success for beautiful conservation-based inspiring landscapes for them to live in. And so we're gonna start tonight really with a premise for those of us in Southern California. Landscapes take up a lot of space in Southern California. Uh, if you look at an aerial photograph of most of our neighborhoods outside of like downtown LA, uh, there's actually quite a bit of green. There might be too much asphalt or too much concrete, but there's quite a bit of green as well. And a lot of that is residential front yards and backyards. It's very different than if you were looking at like New York City. There's quite a bit of space there. And for those of us in the suburbs, which is a lot of us, for a long time, especially with front yards, the, the question has just been, does it fit in with the neighbors or the neighborhood? Or for the few people who would go beyond that, it was purely, what does the landscape look like? And so, you know, this would be considered a pretty diversely planted, uh, maybe even a little bit adventurous landscape for you know, a lot of the history of the suburbs in Southern California. And I want landscapes to be beautiful. I want my landscape to be beautiful for sure. But the last series of droughts, I feel really opened up an opportunity for a new question about our landscapes, which is beyond just what does it look like? What do our landscapes do? What do our landscapes require from us? And what do we get out of them? And we've seen a large shift to where, yes, the front lawn is still the most common landscape in Southern California, but it's not the only thing that's accepted in pretty much any neighborhood. You'll drive through and you'll see examples of multiple styles of landscape, some of which don't contain any lawn at all. We've shifted to where it's pretty common when a house is getting ready to be sold for the front lawn to come out and some sort of water-wise landscape to go in. And so what our landscapes do for us, I think is really an exciting question to ask right now. So this is just a picture actually out of the window of the desk I'm sitting at right now at my house. You can see the base of a young California native garden just growing in. And one of the things that my landscape does in addition to being beautiful is it provides lots of habitats for native pollinators, butterflies and birds. So here you can see a black Phoebe, which if you look carefully has just caught a some sort of a little insect and we're providing habitat for birds. And in turn, those birds as they're 
hunting for seeds, or in this case, insects, provide lots of great entertainment for myself, my partner Kira, and our cats. So that's just one example of what we designed our landscape in our front yard to do for us. But whatever your motivation is, one of the big ideas from this workshop is that California native and water wise landscapes do more than the landscapes that in most cases they would be replacing. And for those of you from uh, farther out in other areas, chances are it's going to be the same if you're looking at the regionally appropriate landscape types for wherever you are from. So if we look at California native and water wise landscapes for Southern California, they're beautiful, just as beautiful, or if not, in my opinion, often more beautiful than the landscapes that they're going to be replacing, the more conventional kind of landscapes with lawn and maybe a few roses or a camellia or something like that. So these are some of my favorite California native plants, all of which and a few succulents are landscapes that once they're established after the first year or two, pretty much watered deep soak about once a month in the warm season and in months that we get some rain, uh, usually not at all. So we're talking, you know, six to nine irrigation, irrigation events a year. And when you do that, you're going to be soaking it for longer than you would a lawn, but you're usually looking at uh, a quarter of the water to have a nice, lush, good looking landscape than you would for a lawn, which still might have some brown spots in it. And as you do that, you're also going to be providing critical habitat needed for butterflies, pollinators, local birds, and you get to see all of that. So you might end up with something uh, like this, a hummingbird nest uh, in your backyard and get to watch that whole process. And all of that together really makes our landscapes more enjoyable places to live and really places of lifelong learning. And whether that's for you or for your kids or your grandkids who come and visit in a landscape that's really adapted to the place that you live in a California native landscape or a water-wise Mediterranean climate landscape, something is always changing. And it's a much more exciting place than a typical conventional landscape. The thing about the typical lawn and maybe a couple of shrubs landscape is that you're doing a lot of work. And in summer, it's you or someone you're paying at least once a week out there with the mower, basically trying to keep what's this living system into a static picture that looks the same all throughout the year. Kind of that's the ideal. It takes a ton of work and effort to get there. But in a California native or water-wise landscape, the kind of the opposite is true. It's about the changes throughout the season. And if you design it that way, you can have something in Southern California year round. So always something is coming into bloom. There's always something coming out of bloom. When you start attracting the butterflies and the pollinators and the birds, there's some butterflies and hummingbirds, for example, that might move into your garden and live there year round. But a lot of birds especially and some of the pollinators will come and go throughout different times of the year and each year is a little bit different so it becomes a very interesting place much more interesting place to spend time in when you're doing your little bit of yard work as well uh, there's going to be less work for a california native landscape than a traditional landscape but all landscapes do have some work uh, but the work's also much more enjoyable as well and it's more seasonal mostly spring and fall kind of cleanup and so all of this together really goes to the potential to provide our landscapes with a much more distinct sense of place than our typical turf and a couple of shrubs landscapes. I really like this quote from Lady Bird Johnson, former first lady, who was one of the first nationwide proponents of working with the landscape material, the plants native to where your garden is. And she said that native plants give us a sense of where we are in this great land of ours. I want Texas to look like Texas and Vermont to look like Vermont. And my take's a little bit more cynical, but my take is basically that it costs a lot to live in Southern California. And if I'm lucky enough to have a spot of land where I could determine what's gonna happen, why would I want my yard in the summer, no matter how much I water it, to end up looking like a parched imitation of what essentially is an East Coast landscape style, or even farther back, maybe a European landscape style. I'd rather wake up to the natural beauty of California every day and enjoy it every evening and 
wherever I move, my partner and I always plant a garden and we have that. And it's wonderful to see it in the morning, the birds out early as we're getting ready for work and to enjoy it in the evening when we get home. So we'll look at just a couple of quick examples. This is a garden that I'm really fond of. This was designed and installed by the homeowner. And I saw it on the Theodore Payne Foundation Native Plant Garden Tour. Theodore Payne Foundation is a nonprofit based in the San Fernando Valley in Los Angeles area that puts on a great native plant garden tour of residential gardens every year in the spring. And they always have a day mostly in the valley areas, San Gabriel, San Fernando Valley, and a day that's more in the city and some of the coastal areas. And so this is a relatively small front yard landscape in Pasadena. And this is kind of on the more naturalistic side, which uh, personally I really like. Uh, it's a pretty simple planting, but lovely, beautiful color contrast, some really nice spring flower color. And this kind of natural uh, loose gravel path. But in addition to just being nice looking and providing habitat, it really changed the experience of this front yard. This is a pretty small front yard. It's on a side street, but it's pretty close to a main street. and if this was just lawn, that house would also feel a lot closer to the street. Uh, probably there would be a lot more uh, noise, at least psychologically, it would feel a lot closer to the street. And by providing this much more layered and kind of complex landscape versus a lawn, it really helped the house feel a lot more set back, almost like it was in a bit of a park-like setting, totally tra transformed the experience of the place all through a relatively simple, easy to maintain, quite low water California native landscape. It's just a few other examples. Uh, if you prefer a more formal look, you can absolutely achieve that. It takes a bit more work, takes quite a bit more uh, clipping to keep everything like that. But here's an example of a more formal, mostly California native front yard with some Mediterranean uh, plant material as well and has a much more formal look if that's what appeals to you. But where do you start? It's one of the big questions. And when you start, one of the other big ideas from this evening is you don't start here. Even though this happens to be the California Botanic Garden Nursery on their plant sale day, uh, it's great nursery, very knowledgeable staff, but you don't start if you're taking on a big project just at the nursery because no matter how good the plants are there, what ends up happening is you get one of this and one of that and two of this and two of that. And ultimately when you get home for most people, then they end up realizing that maybe they bought too many plants that want full sun, but there's not enough full sun area. So things are going into part shade and the plants don't thrive in that area. Uh, sometimes you'll get something that looks really nice and cute with a nice flower in a one gallon pot, but then you get it home and you realize it's gonna be 12 feet wide and you don't have enough space for that. So you cram things together and none of that sets you up for success. And so what we're gonna talk about tonight is really starting with a planning process so that by the time you hit the nursery looking for plants, you're ready and you are going to be much more successful. And so where you start is with your goals. And so this is an example of a list of goals from the most difficult clients I ever worked with as a landscape designer. And the reason why is because they were my parents who were never really interested in this sort of stuff until the first round of rebates hit for the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power area. And at that point in time, uh, they got interested. It just seemed like a really good deal. And the front yard and the backyard lawns weren't being used. And so I helped them redo both the front yard and the backyard. And so this is the list of goals for the backyard. Uh, my dad's list of goals was actually quite easy. It was whatever makes your mom happy. My mom's list of goals were significant for a pretty small backyard space that we'll look at pictures of in just a moment. She was interested in a comfortable place to sit and read, a place that feels relaxing, the sound of water, something that would be relatively simple to maintain, something that would hide a less than attractive cinder block wall that ran around the whole edge of the backyard without spending a lot of money, something that would attract birds, it would look nice, 
a space in there to grow some vegetables and to put all of that in while making a small space feel bigger. And so that is a lot of goals to fit into a small space. But by going through the process of thinking about the goals, being upfront with them, and then starting there to work on a design, we can actually achieve all of that, but we would never get there with hitting the nursery and getting the plants that appeal to our eye, even if those plants are great plants. And so we're gonna talk a lot later about resources for the plant selection part. So stay tuned for that. But we're gonna start with the backyard, blank slate, small black backyard surrounded by cinder block. And so here is April 2015, plant layout day. We had gone through the process of working out our design, going from the concept to what would achieve those goals. And then doing that layout, just working logically, but simply. Uh, you don't need a professional surveyor out to do this sort of site layout. In this case, we had, we're going to have a water feature in the middle, a path surrounding it and a kind of meadow with some flowering accents around it. So just a wood stake from the hardware store. It's got some, uh, had in the garage, some uh, kind of web strapping that doesn't really flex. So tied a loop in it and just put the stake in, pulled it tight, and then just use an old bag of flour to get this perfect circle. Then measured out another three feet, made another one, and just kind of sketching things out. And this is a good time to be sketching things out. Even if you have a very detailed plan on graph paper, kind of walk through your site, take a look at things, shift plants around if you want to. It's all very easy to make sure that everything feels right at this stage. So here we are in April, and this is it uh, a few days later, planted wood chip mulch in, and our path was basically just gonna be defined by the gap in the plants after the plants grow in. And then here is an area waiting for the water feature to go in. And so, this is the point where most people, if they're planting a garden for the first time, think, oh my God, this is just a few plants in a sea of mulch. It's never going to grow in. And I should have gotten two or three times as many plants. But at this point in time, if you've done your research, looked at how big the plants are going to be, have some faith. In this, we're actually using a lot of small plants. So this is actually a pretty close spacing depending on the kind of plants you're using. The plants might even be farther apart and still be well spaced. And so this is April and this is October of the same year in that landscape. So if we planted twice as many plants, we would have been in trouble. We had already had to remove many, many plants. And so to meet all of those goals, we went with the concept of a very simple Mediterranean climate meadow mixing some native sedge, kind of grass-like plant with some Mediterranean bearded iris and some other flowering accents. Here's the water feature for the sound of water. Here is a, a bench with some small trees, actually large shrubs that we pruned up as trees over time. And this lush look, working with this narrow space, but using the water feature, this is from sitting on the bench to provide a sense of separation from the main part of the house and kind of section the small yard off into different places. And then farther towards the corner, there is the one vegetable bed for growing here some winter salad greens. Looking back towards an old lemon tree, which was one of the two trees that we kept in place. And with the habitat part, it really is, if you build it, they will come. So here you can see, this is just a cell phone picture from inside the house and in the middle of Van Nuys kind of suburb of Los Angeles, here is a falcon stopping by to take a drink out of the water feature. And then you can see the vine uh, creeping fig starting to grow in to cover the cinder block wall in the back. And so this is all punctuated by some seasonal pops of color. Here we have Australian kangaroo paws, great Mediterranean climate plant, and South African Mediterranean climate red hot poker, providing seasonal bits of color. And so in a simple, pretty easy to maintain way, we ended up with a landscape that really met all of those goals. And maintenance for this is pretty simple as well. Uh, there's always you know, just a little bit of, you know, a couple of times a month pulling a weed here or there that might have blown in from the neighbors, but not a lot. Uh, and then there's kind of maybe more quarterly 
seasonal cleanup. Uh, the grasses get cut back once a year. Most of the other plants get some amount of pruning once a year. Originally, my parents thought that they were going to be doing their own gardening and did that for a little while. And now they have shifted to actually having someone come. And so they have a skilled gardener come who really knows what they're doing. They are paying that person a lot more per hour than they used to pay the guy who came and mowed the lawn every week. However, that person only comes four days a year. And so in the end, they get really great skilled uh, work on their landscape and it doesn't cost them any more for the maintenance than they were paying for the mow and blow gardener who would just come through the yard uh, very quickly once a week. And so before moving on, we'll look at some little bit of inspiration of some other project types, because it can really look like many different things. So whether it's a modern look, so here is another different but kind of meadowy landscape, very modern looking with punctuated by a couple of California native trees. We could be thinking of courtyard areas as well. This is actually at the California Botanic Garden in Claremont, but very residential scale. And all of these sorts of plants lend themselves very well to kind of organic spaces. So here's an example of a gravel patio space. So very inexpensive for a patio to install something like this. Uh, really pleasant to be in and then surrounded by a mix of some California native shrubs. Some of these are native sages, which smell amazing. And then for some sculptural effects, some succulents as well from different areas. And one of the nice things about the style patio as well is that it's permeable. So when it rains, the water is able to soak directly in, depending on your soil type, but in a lot of areas, the, the so the water will soak directly into the soil, eventually recharging the groundwater basin. So it's environmentally beneficial. And as well, the drainage is a lot less complicated for the site than if this area was all poured to concrete. And then that water would have to move somewhere and be dealt with somewhere else. You often, even in front yards, start to see social spaces start to pop up surrounded by Mediterranean or native gardens. Here's another picture of that slightly more formal garden, but still working with the same plant types. The style could be very modern to where you're using very rectilinear, in this example, some path elements, and then you're able to have a much looser looking landscape. Or it can be very, very naturalistic. I really love the kind of curving shape of this path with the natural river rock, stone, on the edges and the kind of meadowy and flowery cottage garden look. And for those of you who are in Southern California, rebates are available to make it happen. No matter who your water provider is, if you are in the area served by the Metropolitan Water District, who you've probably heard of, they are the water wholesaler who import water from various other parts of California and the Colorado River, and then sell it to the water agencies who then resell it for their imported part of the water that gets to you. Uh, and so they are the regional hub at SoCalWaterSmart.com that your water agency is working with. And so this is the central place to apply for rebates, SoCalWaterSmart.com. And the main one for removing an existing lawn, even if it's pretty brown, and putting in a water-wise garden is called the Turf Replacement Program. They also have some other rebates as well. Their current rebates include the Turf Replacement Program. The dollar amount depends on your water provider because a number of water providers in Southern California are also kicking in additional funds to kind of sweeten the deal. It still all goes through SoCalWaterSmart.com. They also have rebates for weather-based irrigation controllers, which will automatically adjust to the weather, helping save water as well. And then when we talk about the turf replacement program, one of the things that will need to happen is the irrigation system needs to be upgraded. One of the ways to do that is to install what are called rotating sprinkler nozzles, which are much more efficient than the traditional misting kind of sprinkler nozzle. And if you're doing a large area, needing to purchase at least 30 of them, you can get a partial rebate on those as well. So every little bit helps. And we're gonna get back to talking more about the turf replacement program. 
But for those of you who are in our local area, on the western edge of San Bernardino County, there are some local programs as well from your local water agency. And so there is currently a free smart irrigation controller program. So the smart irrigation controller is also sometimes referred to as a weather-based irrigation controller. Same thing. It, this program is available for customers of Monta Vista Water District, City of Ontario, Chino, Chino Hills, Cucamonga Valley Water District, Fontana, and actually Upland as well. It's just a typo that that's not on there. And so if you get your water from one of those sources, you can qualify with doing a watching an online class for a free weather-based irrigation controller that will actually be installed by a, uh, a landscape contractor who is on contract with them. The controllers that they provide are really, really nice controllers. And if you are in an area or if your, your irrigation controller is in an area that can be reached with the home Wi-Fi system, they install one where you can do everything, set it up, make changes all from either your phone or a laptop, and it makes everything so much easier. Uh, in order to get started with that program, you're going to want to give a call to your, your water agency and ask to contact the conservation staff member, and they will be able to get you set up with that program. Uh, it does require you to have a functional irrigation system without a ton of breaks so that there is a potential to save water by having something that responds to the weather. And so now we're gonna talk more about the turf replacement rebate. And this is the one through SoCalWaterSmart.com where you can get a rebate per square foot of turf you remove and replace with a water-wise landscape that meets the specific rebate requirements. And we will go over those requirements. It will give you a refund per square foot up to 5,000 square feet of turf removed. And so you do have some flexibility. Uh, you are definitely welcome to plant areas at the same time that are not turf. So if you're taking out turf and replanting the area that was turf and planters, that's just fine. You'll just only get the rebate on the square footage of turf removed. Uh, conversely, if you have a large yard and you're going to be planting more than 5,000 square feet doing a really big project, that's fine too. You will just only get rebated per square foot up to that 5,000 square feet. And so locally in our area, where our service area is, it's most of the customers will be getting $3 a square foot. If you happen to be a customer of Monta Vista Water District, it's a little bit higher than that. But wherever you are for the water agencies in Southern California that qualify, you'll be getting at least $2 a square foot. Very important. You can't begin any work on your project until after you've received approval for your rebate. And so there's a process to start. You go to SoCalWaterSmart.com, you'll create a login, They'll ask you a bunch of information that you'll have to put in and we'll go over uh, some of that stuff. And then you can apply for the rebate. Then somebody takes a look at that information. Usually it takes uh, two, maybe up to three weeks, depending on the demand. And then you get your official approval. When you get your approval, then you can start your project. But if you start taking out your turf before that, uh, you might not be able to uh, go through the whole thing. They actually do send people out to audit for about 10% of the participants. And so you really need to make sure that you are doing it in the correct order. I'm gonna give you a few tips on the rebate application. These are the areas where I tend to see people kind of get caught up. You're gonna to have to put a bunch of information in. Some of it's pretty obvious, uh, you know, name, address, all that sort of stuff. You're going to need to know your total lot size. So in addition to the area of lawn you take out, you're going to need to know the square footage of your total lot. If you don't have this in your property records handy, usually you can quickly find it for pretty much any address. Just type your address into any search engine. And the first things that come up in most cases will be a bunch of real estate websites they just automatically are able to generate profiles for every single property, whether or not it's been on sale. I think they just go off a database of county records. And so here's an example off of, uh, I think it's off of Zillow, you know, the different uh, real estate websites 
have a different formatting. This is actually for our headquarters. So it's a large property. So here it is in acres, but in most cases it would be square foot. And so wherever it is on that particular real estate website, you will be able to find somewhere the total square footage of your lot. At the time you apply, you will already have to have decided which areas of your turf will be transformed to be removed and put in that water wise garden that meets the requirements. And that would be, you're gonna tell them how many square feet each of front side and or backyard and the number of square feet of each that will be removed. The rebate will pay per square foot up to 5,000 square feet. This may or may not cover the entire cost of the project depending on many factors. If you are doing the project yourself or with help for family and friends, and you are just removing the turf, adapting your irrigation system to be that high efficiency system or converting it over to a drip system, but still using the underground pipe, uh, and then paying for the cost of plant material and mulch, you may very well be able to cover the entire cost of the project. If you are hiring a contractor to do a similar project like that, then I wouldn't assume that it's going to cover the entire cost. However, I have had a few people in recent years say that they were able to find a licensed contractor that did good work and were able to do it just for the cost of the rebate for their specific front yard. Uh, wouldn't necessarily assume this, and we'll talk a little bit about working with contractors later. And then if you are going to be doing things like putting in formal walkways or putting in a patio or something like that, it definitely won't cover the whole cost. However, it could be a nice contribution. If you can measure the areas that you are replacing by hand with a measuring tape, they will that will give you the best kind of most accurate results. However, if it's a very strangely shaped area and the math would be very complicated, something you can try doing is you can look up your address on Google Earth, or sorry, on Google Maps. Uh, just go to maps.google.com or in a search engine, type in Google Maps. And that's the same thing you would use to get directions. But if you type in an address, there is going to be a square you can click that will give you like a satellite image view. And then you can zoom in quite a bit. And if you right click on your mouse, there is a, you can click on uh, measure. It's a little function that it will pull up. And then you can literally connect the dots on an aerial photo. And when you connect the final dot, it will show you the area of that area. So that's a trick you can use if you do happen to have a strangely shaped space. In addition to just taking out the turf and putting in low water plant material, you're going to have to put in some sort of what's called a stormwater retention feature. So think something like a dry stream bed or a what's called a swale or an infiltration basin, basically some sort of depressed area. Often visually, uh, people like to line them with rock, although functionally it's not necessarily required. And it's an area that will capture water co often coming off the roof and let some amount of it soak in again, to help recharge that groundwater table. In addition to that, and we'll talk more about that later on, in addition to that, you're going to have to tell them the total number of plants that you're going to be planting as part of the project. And basically, this is just to make sure that someone's not going to take up the lawn, put in wall-to-wall -wall gravel and just a couple of cheap little plants and call it a day and pocket a bunch of money off of the process. They're trying to make sure that these are really exemplary front yards that are going to look nice and they're going to contribute to the community and not be a blight. And so they're gonna ask you the number and what they're looking for is you need to be planting at least three plants for every hundred square feet of turf you're going to be removing. And so that doesn't mean that every hundred square feet, every 10 by 10 area needs to have exactly three plants. But it, for example, if you are removing a thousand square feet of turf, you need to have at least 30 plants. That is a very easy minimum threshold to meet actually. And that would be more if you're planting kind of larger shrub material. Most gardens are definitely going to exceed that if you're just designing a nice garden. And so with that, you can have a patio area that where you're removing the turf, but any patio areas, walkways for 
square footage of turf that you're asking for the rebate from, you can't be pouring concrete or asphalt. It needs to be permeable, meaning something like gravel or the decomposed granite paths that we look like that we looked at, something where if water falls on it, it will eventually soak into the ground. And so if you have, for example, a 100 square foot uh, decomposed granite patio, then you will need to still meet that plant requirement for the whole project area. You'll just have to have a higher plant density somewhere else. And then getting through some of the other details, you're going to have to have for them and upload a copy of your recent water bill, a copy of your landscape plan. This does not need to be a work of art. I've seen lots of different landscape plans that have been approved. Some of them look like a seven-year-old who's never drawn anything in their life before has drawn it. Uh, so don't get intimidated. If you do a basic drawing of your site, maybe just looking at uh, the aerial photo on Google Maps or even just kind of drawing it out to the best of your ability, doesn't need to be to scale. And just kind of drawing out, maybe if you're gonna have a tree where the tree is gonna be, uh, where some of the shrubs are going to be, a list of a few of the plants that are going to be there. Things like that are, are usually passed with no problem. Also where your water retention feature is going to be. So don't get intimidated. If you want it to be a beautiful detailed work of art, that's great, but doesn't need to be. And then you're also going to need to upload at least five current color photos of the project area, basically just to document, yes, there is a lawn or the remnants of a lawn, at this location, yes, this is the specific location. So the photos need to be a wide enough angle to show that the landscape and ideally like part of the house or part of the garage, something that identifies it as your yard or your house, not that you're taking a picture of some random lawn somewhere else and trying to pull a fast one. So close up pictures of plants or turf don't count because it's not documenting that project at that site. We'll look at a couple pictures in a second. And then after you get your approval, you'll have 180 days to complete the project. After you complete the project, you'll upload some completed photos of the project, and then you can formally request your rebate. Again, it'll be reviewed in a couple of weeks or so. You'll get notification. You did everything right. You'll get notification that uh, it was approved. Worst case scenario, if it's not approved, they'll, they'll let you know why, and then you can fix it and then ask again. Uh, but if you do everything, just meet all the rules and the requirements, uh, it will be approved. And then the uh, last thing to note is that it's just kind of how the tax laws work out. There is nothing that they can do about it, but rebates over $600 will be taxed. You'll receive tax documentation as if it was income at the end of the year. So if you are doing your 5,000 square feet at $3 a square foot and getting your $15,000 rebate check, that's great, but just plan for it in terms of taxes. It's still a great deal, but I always want to mention that because I don't want anyone to be surprised and get caught off guard on that part. So this is an example of my front yard when I started the project. And so you can see they're not asking you to if your lawn is already pretty brown, they're not asking you to irrigate a bunch to green it up. As long as there's that thatch that it's kind of the turf is there in some semblance, that's fine. And then this is a picture kind of showing it's, it's pretty easy to see that this is in fact this property that can be verified. It's a pretty small front yard. So the pictures I sent in did have a lot of overlap and that's just fine but that would not work. That could be anyone's patch of mostly dead lawn. And so I'm keeping an eye on the question and answers. I see some comments uh, that are coming in, which is great, but no questions so far. So we will keep going and we'll talk more about this stormwater retention feature requirement, which is basically holding rainfall in your landscape doesn't need to be all the water that falls on your site. For most people, that's going to be putting in something like a simple dry stream bed that captures some of the water, either coming directly off the roof or coming from a downspout from a roof gutter system. When you are doing your application, you will see that they have a bunch of things you can choose from for your stormwater retention feature. 
a dry stream bed, one of them is a rock garden, one of them is a swale. And if you look at the pictures of them, you'll see that some of them look very similar. Don't get too caught up on what exactly the things are called. Look at the materials, know that you need to plan for capturing some of the rainfall in your landscape, and then just choose the closest one. You're not gonna get rejected based on the label for it, as long as it's something that works for what the goals of what you need to do are. Rain barrels are an option, but there are some caveats with rain barrels. Uh, you can get your credit for having one or multiple rain barrels if there are gutters all the way around the perimeter of the roof. However, usually this is not your best solution because with that 55 gallon rain barrel or even a couple of them, when it rains, those will fill up in just like a couple of minutes often in a decent storm. And 55 gallons of water doesn't actually do that much for you. If we take for an example, a 1000 square foot front yard, say it's planted with California native plants. If we get a decent series of storms after that first one in the winter, you might not have to water for a few months. If there's about an inch of rain a month, you're gonna be good through the winter for each of those months. So you might not need to water at all out there. And then when we finally do get to the dry season, the first time that 1000 square foot landscape needs to get watered, it's gonna take about 600 gallons of water to basically put down the equivalent of that one inch rain event, which sounds like a lot of water, is actually not if you compare it to how much water uh, that lawns take or actually what we pay per gallon for municipal water rates. Uh, however, it's a lot more than that 55 gallon rain barrel. Uh, in addition to that, if a rain barrel isn't screened perfectly and that screening maintained where the water comes into that rain barrel, what you're gonna have is 55 gallons of mosquito habitat right outside your house. So I've worked with some people where they really like the idea of capturing some of the water off the roof in rain barrels and they have like a patio area with potted plants and they'll fill up a watering can with the barrel and uh, water those plants. You know, that makes sense. If it works out for you, that's great. But for most of us, our best bet is going to be capturing the water in the ground and just letting it percolate down into the groundwater, contributing to that collective groundwater recharge. And so here you can see this is my front yard garden at about, uh, I'd say probably six months after planting. And we couldn't put roof gutters on our house. Our eaves are kind of curved in a weird way that would take a whole lot of surgery and adding additional wood onto the eaves in order to stabilize a, a uh, gutter system. And so the water just sheets off the roof. And so we have this bit of a dry stream bed here to capture that water and bring it somewhere more productive to infiltrate into the ground and not lose any of it. For those of you who are really gonna be trying to do this yourself and want to learn more, I'm going to be teaching a three hour workshop about rainwater harvesting for home landscapes coming up in January. It's gonna be on a Saturday morning and it will be over Zoom just like this. So I'd encourage you to join us and we'll be recording that. And so if you can't make that, then uh, you can join the, you can uh, take a look at it at our YouTube channel afterwards. That's gonna be a whole three hour class on just rainwater harvesting for home landscapes. And then if you're interested in our upcoming uh, workshops, you can always get to our listing on Eventbrite. If you go to uh, cbwcd.org slash waterwise workshops. I'll type that into the chat right now for those of you who know. And then someone asked for the YouTube channel. So I will type those both in. So for our upcoming workshops, that's at cbwcd.org slash waterwise workshops. And that'll just kind of automatically redirect you to our Eventbrite page where you can sign up for free. And then uh, for our YouTube channel, That's just cbwcd.org slash YouTube. And that will redirect you directly to the YouTube channel of our workshop recordings. And so those are both, I just typed those into the chat. Uh, good question, just about that rainwater systems that just came in from Whitney. Would you need a surveyor involved? Uh, 
In most cases for a residential yard, when we're talking about, we are moving water. There is a little bit of changing the grades, uh, but in most residential yards, if it's flat or there's just a slight slope, then you're probably fine. If you're on a really, really steep slope, then rain barrels might be the case. If you are on a steep slope and considering doing this, working with professionals would probably be the best way to go. But for most of our suburban yards, uh, where we're working with features like this, uh, we, uh, a homeowner who is really kind of thinking it through can figure it out themselves. And in that full rainwater, uh, in that full rainwater capture workshop, we'll look at some simple options as well for kind of difficult sites. And so moving on, I see some other questions coming in. We will get those uh, to those next time we uh, stop. So when the water falls off of this section of the roof, it just kind of falls into this very small dry stream bed area. There's a slope that goes this way. The base of the house would kind of flood from the water coming off the roof every time it rained when we moved in. And so we put this here and there's also a slight cross slope that will bring water in a big storm event out this way. Coming along to the front walk of the house and bringing water down and away from the house slowly. This is a system here. We didn't really have the, the room based on the slope and the sidewalk to do a dry stream bed. And so it turned into what's called a French drain, which is essentially, this is a, about a one foot deep trench, about one foot wide through here. So the dry stream bed feeds into this area where we dug that open trench and filled it with this rough about inch and a half to two inch gravel. So it can still absorb water and slowly, some will absorb, but in a large rain event, it will slightly kind of continue to move along this way, just following the slight slope of the sidewalk. And from here, it banks left going underneath the walk. We just dug underneath the existing walk and then comes along the side of the house where then it goes to the back where we have a lot more room and it's able to feed a much wider, more naturalistic stream bed and then planted with native plants all along the edge. So basically the new approach to working with rainwater when you're planning out a new landscape is for as much of it as possible, especially coming off the roofs, we wanna slow it down so that it's not moving as quickly. Water that's moving really quickly can have potential to move the wood chip mulch around or if it's, there's empty soil, uh, move soil around. We wanna slow that down. We wanna allow it to spread out like falling off the roof and hitting that wider dry stream bed uh, or going to the wider dry stream bed in this case over in the back and then allow it to sink into the ground. And ideally, that final place where you would be sinking any of the excess water, if you can, it's best practice to find a place at least 10 feet from your building foundations to allow that to soak in to avoid long-term uh, potential complications with the building. Now, sometimes people have narrow areas and anything will be better than you know a current flooding situation that's up against the foundation. So you work with what you have, but that is the general best practice is to have your final place where that water would sink in uh, at least 10 feet from building foundations. And then think about where that water is gonna go if there's ever a huge storm and that water needs to overflow. So again, in that full workshop, we're gonna cover all of this in a lot more detail, but the basics can be pretty simple. And so this is a picture from my backyard with the young garden growing and around it where things are able to get much wider and there's a broken concrete couple of slabs as a little bridge along the footpath that goes through here. So really the key to doing this is starting with just simple and logical observation. Take a look at your yard. When it rains, where does the water come from? Is it coming mostly from the roof? Is it washing down from the street? Does your neighbor have an all concrete backyard and their uphill uh, lot from yours? And is it coming off of their lot down onto yours? How much water is it? Is it a just a small trickle that's gonna be easy to deal with? Or do you really have a lot of water and some serious erosion problems that you need to deal with while you're taking this on? How does it move through your property? And where does it naturally want to end up? So like in this case, uh, for our yard, the water 
on the uphill side came off of the roof and naturally ended up pooling and flooding like right at the base of our house. And so that's where our kind of intervention would need to start to bring it to somewhere more beneficial. I've also worked with people who don't have kind of much of a problem at all. They had a, for example, one person I worked with in Chino Hills in what was currently a lawn in their backyard, there was just kind of a natural low spot and the water already pooled there. So all they had to do is dig it out a little bit more, put in some rocks to maybe make it look like a nicer feature and they were pretty much uh, done. So it, it's all gonna be site specific, just logically looking at what's going on. This is a good time of year to start thinking about this sort of stuff because you'll be able to hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, catch a storm event or two and really study it much more carefully than maybe you have in the past to kind of figure out how to unlock your site's potential to have a really nice feature that can look nice in your landscape and also functionally help capture and conserve some water. And so we're just gonna look at one more, slightly more in-depth example from a home in Pasadena. And starting in the front yard, you can see here an example where this house did, does have uh, roof gutters, but one thing that you can do, which helps start that slow spread sink process and also looks much nicer is replace a typical metal downspout with what's called a rain chain. And so this is an example, they come in different styles and different shapes, but replacing that less than attractive uh, downspout with the rain chain, what happens is then when it rains, each link in this rain chain, the water falls in bits and kind of bounces down each of these. It looks nice as it's going, but what that's functionally doing is it's dissipating the velocity of that fast moving water as it bounces through each link of this chain to where it gets down to the base. Now, in this case, uh, they had a large ceramic pot that was drilled out larger at the bottom that was helping filter out some of the grit that was coming off of this asphalt shingle roof. Usually that's not something that you see, but something that I do like also with kind of dissipating that velocity is that there was just some gravel right at the base there, even though the front yard was mostly in wood chip mulch and it sloped kind of away from this area. So the water would come down this rain chain, would hit the gravel and start to spread out. And a lot of the kind of velocity was, was already calmed down some. And so then that water can flow out into the mulched area and is not going to have as much kind of erosive power or power that would move the mulch all around in a big storm of it. But the main feature that we, we're gonna look at is along the side of the house starting with here in this case made sense just to keep the old uh, the old downspout but you can see here instead of falling into the soil right away goes onto this piece of concrete pitch this way again dissipate some of that velocity and then pitch it into this another example of that French drain so not a lot of room to work here so this is a trench filled with that inch and a half to two inch gravel and then working with some cobblestone and a few boulders as well to create a more natural look. And then here, the contractor, this was designed and installed by a contractor called Scrub J Studios. Uh, they used recycled terracotta roofing tiles as a nice aesthetic way to edge it with some young native plants still growing in on the sides. And so the water would come into that would flow around, would go underneath this existing concrete walkway, around to the front, and then finally out over here where you can have this wider infiltration area around from the side of the house. This house used to have flooding issues. Now the water all goes passively around to the front. And then if there is a huge storm event, the water is already in a safe area where this can overflow and then the water would just trickle through the landscape and if it needed to, just out to the curb, preventing any damage to the house. This is a very naturalistic front yard, a spring wildflower meadow with some other shrubby California native plants. I think it's beautiful, may or may not be your aesthetic, but even if you like a much more formal aesthetic, the way that the water moves can 
can be the same uh, no matter what kind of look that you like. However, for people who like a natural aesthetic, it really can add to the beauty of the yard. And it can be kind of rougher DIY project, or it can really be a work of art. This is obviously someone who's probably done this before, but really working with different sizes of local rock and gravel to make something very nice looking. I encourage you, if you are going to take something on like this, to work with this style of rock, our, our local river rock, it's mostly granite or sometimes some other types because those other quote uh, ornamental gravels and rock, what happens is those might look good in a small area, but once you get it to the scale of a landscape feature, the stuff that often comes in bags, those kinds of pebbles, uh, they only usually come in one specific graded size for whatever style of rock or gravel that is. And once you start to build a landscape feature with it, if you only have one size, it's, it ends up looking very artificial in the landscape, where with our local materials, not only is the price better, but you can mix different sizes, which is one of the keys to really getting a nice look out of it. Here's another example of, in this case, taking water that would come down the driveway and head if this was a lawn where the thatch was kind of overgrown, that water would head towards the garage. So here the lawn came out, there's a slight cross pitch in the asphalt driveway, and the water comes through here and then around to the side where anything that wouldn't be infiltrated in this little feature can then go out into this young landscape where it's not gonna cause any damage to the garage. And so with all of that in mind, now we're gonna talk a little bit about choosing plants and then we will do a kind of quick design sketch example. One more question that came in from Joel for Chino Hills. Uh, do we need permits for parkways in Chino Hills? I do not believe that you do. I, for most residential landscape retrofit projects, if it's not like new construction, new landscape, uh, as long as you're not building any structures, but you're mostly doing like plants, irrigation, maybe a, you know, a little patio or a pathway, uh, permits are not required. Now I'll say to, you know, if you're concerned, double, triple check, call the city. Uh, but I've worked uh, providing just basic design consultation to a number of projects in Chino Hills through the programs that we offer at the Waterwise Community Center. And I've never had a Chino Hills resident uh, mention to me that they have needed to get a permit to do their work or any problems they had from not getting a permit to do that basic sort of landscape work. Uh, you know, if you're building a overhead trellis or something like that uh, structure, definitely, uh, most likely you would need approval from the city. So moving on to choosing plants. So there's a lot of stuff to think about before you start choosing plants. But as you've started to think about all of this stuff, choosing plants becomes a, a little bit uh, simpler because you're starting to think of how your space might be separated into different areas. You're starting to think about your goals. If you're gonna have a patio over here and a walkway over there, now all of a sudden you're not looking at a big blank slate, but you might start to understand, well, okay, I'm gonna need a, a tree, maybe to provide some afternoon shade to the patio. And I'm going to need then a couple of shrubs and some smaller you know, ground covers. It, it starts to, the more you've thought out your goals and your site, uh, the choosing the plant starts to become a little bit easier and that'll become even more apparent when we do our design example. The key with choosing plants is basically you're gonna to wanna to do some fun research. And chances are, as you do that research, and we'll look at a couple of examples of where to do that research, uh, chances are you might fall in love with a bunch of plants. If that starts to happen, remember that for most of us, you're going to want to keep it pretty simple. Don't put in a hundred different kinds of plants and crowd them. Most people who I work with don't want to become people who are like gardening is my main hobby. I want to be out in my garden with my pruners every weekend. This is what I like to do. Some people that's the case. My partner and I, we are those people. And in our backyard and front yard, we have 250 different cultivars and species of California native plants. And it's a lot of work because of that. But we love that. And that's also part of what we do for a living. 
for most people that are up for some seasonal maintenance and just want to have a low maintenance, nice looking, don't use a lot of water yard, average front yard, somewhere between 10 and 20 different kinds of plants. And I've seen and helped design yards with even less than 10. Uh, but for most people, under, under 20 different kinds of plants still allows you uh, a tree or two, a good selection of shrubs, and some nice kind of smaller plants, even if you have sunny and shady areas. And keeping that simple is really one of the keys of helping you create a more coherent look. One of the places where people often go wrong if they're first time gardeners, even if they're doing everything right with removing the turf and getting things going is when they get to the nursery, they buy one of this and one of that and two of this and one of that other thing, continue and continue, and they have 75 different plants. And it's very hard to achieve a coherent look to a landscape. But if you have 12 different kinds of plants, it's a lot easier. Because then you could be repeating, you could be putting your plants in groups. Uh, it, it's just going to set you up for success much more. And the maintenance, you're, you're going to be able to learn about those plants you do have. And again, set yourself up for success much more. As you're thinking about plants, the most important thing is to match the plants you select to your soil and site conditions. You might hear the term, and certainly if you look at our other classes, you'll hear the term right plant in the right place. You want to put the right plant in the right place. Most people who think they're bad at growing plants, honestly, just don't go into it doing that little bit of research to make sure that the plant that they're putting in is going to be well adapted to that area. For some people, that will make all the difference. And the main factors to consider are sun, and shade is an area going to be full sun, part sun, or mostly shady. Full sun in our area is six or more hours of direct sunlight throughout most of the year. So that doesn't need to be full blasting, blasting sun year round. It can be sun for, you know, from sun up through noon. And even then, you know, a little bit of shade after that can still qualify as full sun. Think six or more hours of direct sun. Uh, especially this time of year, as the days are getting shorter, if it has that, then you should be good in terms of sun. Drainage and soil type. Essentially, in our local area, most of us in the valley areas are going to have sandy or loamy soils, and those are what are called well-drained soils. For those of you who are in areas with clay soils, you're gonna to have to take that into consideration as you select your plants, because most clay soils don't drain as well as those other soil types. And so for our local area, that's mostly going to be most of Chino Hills is pretty clay soil, as well as pockets of Rancho Cucamonga, I know, uh, can have pretty heavy clay as well. The most important thing about that clay is whether or not it drains, however. And I have worked with some people who have done drainage tests in their clay soil in Chino Hills and found that although it's clay, it drains well. The reason why this is important is because most native and water-wise Mediterranean plants want what's called well-drained soil. For how to do a simple drainage test, which just requires a shovel, digging a few holes and then filling them and timing them, uh, but in a very specific way, you can check out our California Native Landscape Design Guide, which is a small PDF publication our agency put together. Even if you're not interested specifically in native plants, there's some good design tips and tricks, including the drainage test. And you can download that for free. If you go to the URL here, cbwcd.org slash native design guide, it'll just load that PDF in most uh, browsers right into that browser. So give it a couple of minutes and then you can click save and it will save it to your computer. Essentially what you do is you dig a hole about a foot by a foot, fill it up with water once or twice and let it drain out. Doing that those first couple of times just to make sure all the soil is very wet all around that hole. And then you fill it a final time and time as that water goes down. And through the whole profile of that soil, you want to get an idea of how many inches per hour it drains. And you don't just wanna measure the first hour because sometimes it slows down the more it drains. But essentially, if your, so if your soil is draining two inches or more per hour, that final time you fill it, 
you have well-drained soil and you can grow those variety of plants that want well-drained so drained soil. If it's between one and two inches per hour, it's going to be kind of medium drainage soil and you might be able to get away with it, but if we get uh, like a huge series of storm events, uh, some of those plants might suffer a little bit. It's kind of medium, or you could plant your plants that uh, want well-drained soil a little bit higher in the ground on some mounds, and you should be good. If your soil is drains less than one inch per hour, you have slowly draining soil, which is actually in most cases, uh, not too much of a problem. You're just going to need to make sure that you are planting plants adapted to clay soils. And there's plenty of plants. And in some cases it might even make your plant decisions a little easier because you're just eliminating the, the other plants that can't take it, but plenty of plants for a really nice garden. And then finally, really look up and take into account the mature size of the plant. Everything looks small and cute in a one gallon container, especially if it's in flower. If the information about the plant says that the plant's going to be seven feet wide, it will be seven feet wide, sometimes in only a year or two. If it says it's going to be 10 feet wide, assume it's going to get 10 feet wide. So many landscapes, the, the look is ruined by the fact that people put too many plants too close together. And those landscapes at six months old look great, but by the time they're three years old, they look overgrown, they need to be cut back a lot and you lose the, the shape of the plant or planting plants too close to, a, close, too close to the edge of a pathway or a driveway as well. If you have a plant that's gonna get six feet wide, don't put it a foot off the edge of your driveway because you're gonna end up having to hedge that edge of that plant and it's gonna ruin the whole look of your landscape. So right plant in the right place, matched to these conditions, doing a bit of basic research. For those of you in Southern California, especially in our Inland Valley areas, we created a website called the Inland Valley Garden Planner that is all about learning about and selecting the best plants for our local landscape. And I will show that to you really quickly. So this is it, just need to resize my window a little bit. So this is the Inland Valley Garden Planner at inlandvalleygardenplanner.org. It's a project by the Waterwise Community Center. And we here we have detailed profiles and information in a searchable database with some other bells and whistles about the top slightly over 350 top plants for gardens in our region. So it's not everything you can grow, but it is most of the water-wise material you would find at a nursery, even some of the specialty nurseries. If you're a real native plant enthusiast and you're getting stuff at like Theodore Payne Foundation or the California Botanic Garden, they will have things that we don't have on this list, but we do have over 120 native plants. And so if selecting plants is all, kind of intimidating to you, you can go right to this garden style section. And here we have pre-created plant palettes of things that match each other in terms of the conditions that they like, in terms of the amount of water that they need. And so, for example, if you're interested in a garden that attracts butterflies and songbirds, you can go here and you'll get a description, a list of plants that will include options for trees, shrubs, perennial plants, and in this case, a grass, and then information about the horticulture and the amount of water it's going to need in the garden once it's established and some other information as well in order to understand that all a little bit better. And then each of these plants in the list then has its own area where you can see pictures far away and close up of the plant, different situations, its own description, details about the water needs. And then for each of these plants, the, that important information, the height, the width to anticipate, the flower season, if you're trying to make sure you have flowers all throughout the year, the soil adaptations, uh, the exposure, meaning how much sun or shade, and then other information about it. And then all of these, either you or your gardener is gonna to need to know how to maintain it. On most of these plants, the maintenance is pretty simple, but 
For example, one of the critical things is that some of these plants do most of their growing in the spring, some of them do most of their growing in the fall. So a lot of these plants might only get some cleanup, a little bit of pruning once a year, but usually to be successful, you want that to be right before it's gonna do its main growing. Not always, but often that's the case. And so you need to know what season is that gonna be? Uh, oftentimes people will over maintain some of their plants. And so some of these maintenance entries tell you also kind of what we see people doing and what not to do. Uh, it's all pretty simple, but knowing that specific information for the specific plants you put in the ground is really important. And then you can use that to put together your own maintenance guide custom for your garden. If you are hiring a gardener to maintain your landscape, there are lots of really hardworking gardeners in Southern California. The reality of the situation is that most of them, unless they specialize in this kind of plant material, don't yet know this information about your specific plants. And so to get the best results, it might be on you to do a little bit of work learning this or reading it, and then maybe putting together for yourself a guide for what should be done in each season, and then communicating with your landscaper, if they're just a general landscaper, uh, what you want to happen when to help set you and the landscaper up for success. And so that's if you go into this using the garden styles selection. The main heart of this website though, however, is our plant finder where you can select, for example, you want a shrub that's low water, it's gonna be in full sun and it's in clay soil. And let's just say also you want it to be good for birds and wildlife. So then from 350 plants, you're down to 45. And from there, you can start to just look at the pictures, look more specifically at the size. Some of these are gonna be much larger shrubs. Some of these are gonna be smaller shrubs. And then going directly into the profiles and learning more about them. And then if you are working on putting together a project or for whatever reasons, you can also sign up and create a login and a password and you can save different lists. So you can have a list for you know, design idea one, list for design idea two, list for your grandma's house and be able to easily get back to those. And so there's a few other functions in here as well. There's some helpful lists of, for example, like plants for small spaces. Uh, there's a lot of stuff to check out. So I encourage you to take a look at that. The watering information specifically is for inland Southern California Valley areas, but all of the other information is going to be useful. Most of these plants will grow all throughout Southern California up into Central California. And if you're on the more coastal areas where it's less hot, you're just going to be able to get away with watering a little bit less. And so that's the Inland Valley Garden Planner. For those of you who are in our local uh, service area, so if customers of Chino, Chino Hills, Cucamonga Valley Water District, Monta Vista Water District, Ontario, Fontana, and Upland, you also qualify for our Residential Landscape Design Assistance Program, which is separate from the turf replacement rebate. This is a program that our agency runs directly in collaboration with the Inland Empire Utilities Agency and these local water agencies. And so you would work with us directly on that. If you want to, you can use the designs that we create as through this program for your application for the turf replacement rebate. But we also are happy to work with people who just have a patch of weeds or are down to dirt. You don't need to be replacing turf. And we will work with you to design either a front yard or a backyard in a water-wise garden style. It's a no-cost program, but we do require a $100 refundable deposit, which you can get a full refund check for $100 back if within a year of working with us, you put in a WaterWise garden in that space and then send us some pictures and fill out a survey. You'll start by choosing one of those design styles that I showed on the Inland Valley Garden Planner as just a conceptual base to get started with. And then we add other plants here and there as we need, as we do a site specific design. You'll send us measurements of your yard, photos of your site. And then right now we are doing these programs online via Zoom. So we'll have an online screen sharing meeting and we'll actually get started on the design for your yard, 
then after we have made significant progress in our meeting, we finish it up and send you your documents and are able to kind of answer questions as you go to help you in your process. So if you are interested in that and you are a customer of one of these water agencies, you can get the full details and then submit the online form to request an appointment at cbwcd.org slash design assistance. And so here's an example of the eight garden styles. And then we always tell people if there's a style that, you know, if you don't find something that appeals to you, we can work with you to create something uh, other than this. However, so far, uh, this we kind of created these really responding to what we see most people are wanting when they start to work with us. And so just one note about construction planning. Most important thing is make sure you consider it. I've worked with a lot of people in the past. They get really excited. They'll rip out their lawn and then realize that they're not sure what, what they're going to be doing next. So think about, are you going to be taking on what you're thinking about all at once in phases or a bit at a time when you find the time kind of a weekend here and a weekend there? Any of those are fine, uh, but take that into your consideration. If you can, plan to plant in the best season for doing so. In Southern California, the best season for planting is mid to late fall into the early winter. Through the middle of the winter is fine. And early spring, kind of March, maybe the very beginning of April is the absolute latest I would encourage anyone to plant. And if you really wanna set yourself up for success, kind of week before Thanksgiving through around New Year, slightly after is really the best time to plant because you'll get your plants into the ground when the weather is cool. We might have a heat wave, but even if it gets hot, kind of peak temperature, the days are quite a bit shorter and the plants might grow some. Some will just get going right away, but others will not show too much growth at the top, but the roots will be getting settled in. So that when we hit spring the following year or that summer heat really gets going, the plants will be able to respond with growth, but they'll be well rooted into where they'll be less likely to stress. And it just makes everything easier on the plant, easier on getting it established and easier on you as the gardener. You never wanna plant in the middle of summer. Summer is a good time for contemplating design, killing turf, it's the best time for killing turf and preparing irrigation. As you're thinking about this, work with your budget and adjust your design and phasing as necessary. And if you're working with a contractor, bring them in early. Talk with them about budget. Good contractors are really busy. Usually a halfway decent contractor, and don't use this as a filter because you might just hit a contractor at the right time. But most contractors, it's going to be usually a month, two months, three months before they might have time in their schedule. They're gonna have a lot of jobs lined up. And so bring them in early. I always encourage people to always get at least three quotes from con different contractors from their site. It's another useful uh, purpose for having a nice design drawn out to really show them exactly what you're looking for. The quotes in the, with landscape contractors can be really varied. Uh, so you always wanna get at least three. The lowest one is not always the best to go with. Sometimes the lowest one is the guy with the least experience who might realize they bid the job wrong and come back to you halfway through the job asking for more money. So if one seems way low, uh, don't necessarily go with them just because it's low. Whoever you're considering going with, ask them for references of similar size projects. So if it's a whole front yard, you wanna make sure you're asking for references of whole yards, not just a couple of planters or not just a yard that they maintain. And then call those references. They should be able to provide you with, with good references. Make sure you're gonna be working with someone who does good work. Uh, I don't say this to scare you, but if you work with the right contractor, the whole thing could be really a great experience. If you work with the wrong contractor, it can be a nightmare. So just do that little bit of extra due diligence to get multiple quotes and follow those references. Technically in California, any job that's more than $500 of combined plant material and labor should be done by a licensed landscape contractor. So a specific license, a C27 license. And if they have a license, they should have a license number that they can share with you. You can actually look that up online, make sure that their license is current as well. 
hiring a licensed landscape contractor, they're required to carry insurance as well. Also protects you if somebody gets injured, uh, one of their employees, while that landscape installation is happening. And so with that, we will move on. But one quick thing to say about co considering this process, uh, we'll talk a bit about turf, actually killing the turf and removing the turf after we go through this design example. For most of us, the best time to be doing that is going to be in the spring or summer. So if you are just starting to think about this process now, you don't want to rush through all of this. If you're doing a whole yard, you really want to set yourself up for success. And so if you're just starting to think about this now, you might want to really plan it out to take your time thinking about the design, looking at how the water falls this winter, figuring out your design, maybe even starting to talk with contractors and budgeting. Then when spring hits and the grass is really growing, then kill your grass in the spring or even midsummer, have your irrigation ready to go and then plant next year fall around this time. It can be worth it to wait that whole time, depending on what you want to do and how much maintenance you want to be doing in terms of like lawn trying to potentially grow back. Uh, so we'll talk about that a little bit more as we get to the turf replacement part. Uh, see question came in from Joel about uh, chemicals or weed guard and uh, We'll be talking about all of that after we do the design example as we get into the uh, the turf re removal part. Uh, quick question from Carol. Saw that in the plant information on the Inland Valley Garden Planner that plants are slow or moderate or fast growth. So it was kind of how fast would, would it be to be full size in a year? Uh, it depends on the, the plant. So for, for shrubs, uh, a fast growing shrub might be close to full size in a year, between one and three years, depending on the shrub and depending on the size. A fast growing shrub that's gonna be four feet wide could very well get there in a year. A fast growing shrub that's going to be nine feet wide is probably not gonna get there in a year, but two or three. Same thing like a fast growing tree that's gonna be 40 feet tall, won't get there in a year. Uh, but could get, we'll get there a lot faster than a slow. So, so fast, medium, slow is not a perfect system, but for, for like perennial smaller plants and shrubs, uh, fastest ones, you know, a year or two, maybe up to three, uh, and then slower ones could, could take longer than that. Uh, so it, it kind of depends. Uh, it also depends on the site, the amount of sun, but we break it into fast, medium, or slow just to give you some relative idea, best we can. So with that, we'll transition to looking at bringing it all together in a quick design example. So this is an example. This is an excerpt from our California Native Landscape Design or California Native Garden Design online workshop, and you can catch it live and be able to ask questions. We'll be teaching it again in the spring. We're about to publish our schedule for next spring, but we do have a recording of it on our YouTube channel right now if you want to dive deeper into this and a whole lot more about California native landscape design. We also have a whole additional class called do-it-yourself landscape design, which is a little bit more general that goes much deeper into that kind of goal setting process uh, that we talked about at the beginning and following that through. And so here is a quick example. This is the example of the front yard of the place where I am living now and how we started to look at taking on a landscape design. Starting with our goals, and this is our very rough base plan. So I always start with my goals first. And so my partner Kira and my goals for this front yard was for it to be a beautiful front yard to drive up to, to come home to. And also very importantly, to look out our windows and if we have the door open and just the screen door, to be able to look out into this front yard. Uh, you know, when we drive home, it's nice to kind of see the garden as a welcome home, but realistically, we don't spend a ton of time hanging out in our front yard. We more use the backyard for that. So 
most of our experience of our front yard is actually through our windows of the various rooms of the house looking out. So we want it to be beautiful. We want it to provide habitat specifically for pollinators, birds, and butterflies, and lizards as well. We want it to be low water. We wanted to enhance a bit of a sense of privacy in the front yard. We live in a cul-de-sac where the houses have relatively small front yards. Uh, they're definitely not tiny. Total planting area here is about 1,200 square feet, but because of the way the houses face each other, they actually kind of feel a little bit smaller than they are. And so if I'm at any of these windows, uh, most for most angles, there's about four other houses kind of facing directly uh, into them. I'm actually sitting at the desk right here right now. And during the day, if I have the blinds open, I'm looking directly into the living room across the street, a uh, pretty narrow street, and I can you know, see what they're watching on TV. So we wanted to provide a little bit more sense of privacy without totally having just a hedge or a fence all the way around and turning our back to the neighbors. We wanted it to smell really nice using some nicely scented plants to uh, wear on a warm day or on a rainy day, walking from the house to the driveway, or even just having the windows open, we can get a little bit of that nice smell from the garden. And this house faces north. We're in Pomona in an area where unfortunately there's not a lot of street trees. So the, the few streets nearby are really hot in the summer, but because of those lack of street trees, the, this part of our house faces north and we do have a great view of the San Gabriel Mountains. And so we wanted to kind of create a balance of providing more sense of privacy, but still strategically in areas leaving our best mountain views open. And so same thing, we can definitely do all of that, but that's not gonna happen by randomly getting plants of different sizes and putting them in, even if they're adapted to you know, the sun and the soil and all of that. So we're starting with our goals. And then the next thing that I'll normally do is draw just a rough base map. If you're the kind of person who wants to jump straight to taking all your detailed measurements and drawing everything out on graph paper, that's great. By all means, go for it. But if that's intimidating to you at all, you don't need to go there, especially right away. So the way I drew this and the way I would often get started for a, just a residential front yard or backyard design is I will in uh, Google Maps, I will pull up the property, uh, type in the address on Google Maps, bring it up, zoom in, and then click on that square that gives you the aerial photo view. And as long as you don't have huge tree canopies, just kind of roughly drawing things out on just a plain piece of paper. Oftentimes, you know, the first couple of times that I'll be totally off with just the sizes of the house versus the planting areas. But by the third time, you know, it's, it's close enough just to get basic ideas down. It doesn't need to be measured out. In this case, I drew it on a, a tablet because it'll show up a lot easier uh, in this presentation. And just getting the basic shapes down. So here you can see it's a cul-de-sac. So it's curved here. Here's our driveway, walkway, uh, the basic shape of the house, where the ridges are, because we'll mark down where the water goes off the roof later, where the windows are and the doors are important for views, thinking about the views out to different parts of the garden. Here's the neighbor. It has just a gravel strip here and then their driveway. And then anything else that's going to be really important. So one example is uh, we noticed after we moved in, as I was digging around working on the plumbing, that the main line from the meter bringing water to the house had been redone, uh, which was good, but it was only buried about six inches deep, which is not ideal. So that was something relevant for me to mark because as I'm thinking about putting in things like a dry stream bed, I need to be careful that I'm not going to expose that pipe either by breaking through it or by just designing something that would have the pipes sticking out of the ground after I dug down. So anything that's gonna be specifically relevant, that starts as your base plan. If you are doing this on paper, you want to then, once you have a base plan that you like, scan it or photocopy it a bunch of times and never just kind of have it saved. And then unless you photocopied it a bunch of times, which is one way to do it, you always want to maintain at least one just totally clean base layer. Uh, because you don't want to have to redraw this every time that you want to make some changes or you want to look at a few different ideas for your landscape. And so then with that base layer, 
you will draw out a basic site analysis. And that's just a fancy way of just saying, noting down your observations. So if you're working on paper, one convenient way to do it is to get a pad of tracing paper. And then you can do that in one or multiple sheets of tracing paper lined up over that base layer. You're gonna observe for as long as it takes. If you've recently moved on to a property, especially if you haven't been through a rainy season, it's good to ideally at least get through one rainy season because what you observe might be different than what you're guessing you're going to see. That was definitely the case with my house. I kind of generally knew where the water was gonna be going, but could not anticipate how much certain areas were gonna flood in the yard. You're gonna look at what areas are sunny, what areas are shady, test that soil and drainage. And if there's areas with particularly poor drainage, or if there's an area you know that's really compact that you're worried about because someone used to park a truck there, those are the things you can mark down. Uh, important views, either to preserve or views that you might want to block. Like if your neighbor uh, second story looks directly down into your hot tub, that might be something where you want to put a shrub or a tree to block that view. Where water flows on the property, any specific microclimate, so specifically hot or cold areas. So one example would be if you, you know, the area right along an asphalt driveway that just gets pounded with afternoon sun, or for example, uh, on my side yard, I have an area where one side's an asphalt driveway, then there's a small planting bed, and then the other side is a stucco wall that all gets blasting afternoon sun. So that area is hotter than the rest of my yard. And that might be a great area to work with some beautiful desert plants that can really take that heat and just respond to that heat with more flowers instead of looking stressed. Are there noise or other neighbor issues that maybe you wanna cover up with the sound of a water feature? And then are there existing plants that you would wanna keep? Might include seasonal weeds that you know you're gonna to have to do extra work to deal with, but more importantly, uh, like existing trees or existing shrubs that you wanna hold onto. So for example, even if you're moving towards a water-wise landscape, if you have a beautiful mature magnolia tree, that's always gonna require more water than the rest of that landscape. Then maybe you're gonna work with drip irrigation to make sure that you can continue giving that medium water use tree the water it needs because it's a beautiful long-term investment that took a long time to grow. And then the other areas in the landscape farther away from the root zone can go towards a more water-wise landscape. And so here is an example of that site analysis over that particular front yard. Uh, doesn't need to be rocket science. So just getting things down to make sure that this is handy when we start working on the more detailed design. So keeping that mountain view. This is an area that felt too open that we wanted some height to some of the plants. And so keeping that balance, this is the main open planting area because this is the north side of the house, we have the condition where in the fall, definitely middle of winter and early spring, this area right up against the north side of the house is pretty shady, but then midsummer when the sun's very high, it's full blasting sun. So that's always a tricky area. There are definitely plenty of plants that can take that part of the year sun, part of the year very shady, but we wanna have that down roughly how far that shadow is just based on that observation, that experience, and our best guess, to then uh, be able to have that handy thinking about that as we think about what plants go where. And then with this yard, the, the big challenge was the, the flooding. So the water coming off the roof here, here, coming off here, and then the general slope is this way. And so we get a lot of water here that there, it would just kind of stay here and also flood in the driveway up against the house this way as well. So that was our big problem to solve and turn into something more beautiful and more useful for the project. And so as we move past the general analysis, we're gonna start just thinking conceptually. So not this specific plant goes here, this specific plant goes there yet, but just starting to think about massing form where we might want a tree, where we might want a hedge, where we might want some shrubs. And so this is just kind of a first example of responding to those goals, responding to that site analysis. So this layer here, we're gonna have a small deciduous tree here and a small evergreen tree here. And kind of doing that analysis also standing out there, we realized that we can provide a small multi-trunk deciduous tree here 
that would provide more, uh, much more of a sense of privacy. It would lose its leaves midwinter, but the structure of that multi-trunk tree is all that would be needed to provide that, that bit of a sense of privacy. And this tree in this location would actually align with the tree in the background where we wouldn't lose the mountain view, that our best mountain view is actually kind of through these windows in this direction. So on this side, we'd have an informal hedge that would be a maximum of about six feet. And so we'd be able to see right above that to the mountains. But here where we're just looking out at our neighbor's gravel strip and then the cars in the driveway, that's something where we can have a pretty dense informal hedge. We don't need to see that. And then that kind of creates an inner space where we can make this relatively small space start to feel bigger by working with layering and heights of the landscape material. So from these windows, which are the main way that we see the landscape, we work with smaller plant material closer up from the view we can see with the windows. At the edges of the windows, we can work with some taller shrubs that maybe just have a branch or two that start to frame the view out of the windows. And then we'd have smaller material. We'd have a meadowy area. We'd have some accent mid-sized shrubs. And then the taller layer at the edge with the hedge or the trees. And so by having those different layers built up, we build a sense of depth into the landscape. And then finally, for the plants, you'll see the seas, which we very intentionally wanted to have some pops of color. Because we're providing ourselves more privacy, we want to leave these pops of color at the edges so that there's still a little bit of layering for the neighbors walking in the neighborhood, cars driving by. It's not just like a wall at the edge of the landscape. And then, you know, as the mailman comes and people might walk up the driveway to make it very welcoming. And then here you saw the pictures where we decided to take that flooding area and have that dry stream bed that becomes the French drain and then brings water around the side of the house and eventually to the backyard. And so, and also citing things like a bird bath where we thought about, well, if we put a bird bath basically here, that'd be able to be seen from both these windows, whether that's birds in it for us to catch, or also uh, our cats like to hang out in these two rooms as well. So for them to see it from whichever room they happen to be in. And so with that, then we kind of get more detailed and more detailed. So from there, we start to think about what plants might go where, not worrying exactly about plant counts or this many of this or this many of that, but just starting to list for these different areas what ideas. So for the two trees, we actually got to the point where we figured out probably we'd have a restaurant, western redbud for the deciduous one, a toyon, which is a large shrub that can be pruned into a tree for the evergreen one, our two species of plants we'd probably use for the hedge, and then here's our list of plants that would work well in that some part of the year shade, some part of the year very sunny. And then our kind of shrubs here, thinking about our accent plants you can see. Also getting a little bit slowly more detailed, we realize that we have room for not just three accent plants, but maybe some large bunch grasses, some deer grass, and then a few different shrubs, choosing our main species for our meadow area, our yarrow, and slowly getting there. Now at this point in time, depending on your style of what you like to do, you have a couple of choices. If you are thinking about taking it on, thinking that you might be up for it, I would highly encourage you to take detailed site measurements and draw everything out what's called to scale on graph paper, where each square on the graph paper is the equivalent of one foot or two feet in the real world. Uh, if you are going to do that, the best resource that I know of that's kind of simply explains that is another free downloadable PDF. Uh, it was created by a group called G3, the Green Gardens Group, that does a lot of consulting work for water agencies around gardening education. The one that I really like, it's just very simple and direct, was one that was funded by the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. And you can, it's another PDF that you can download for free. And that you, if you go to cbwcd.org slash G3 book, that's an automatic redirect to their website. And it will load that entire PDF for most web browsers into the web browser. So give it a few minutes and then you can save it. And there's a lot of great tips in there, but the part that I like the most is the site plan part where starting on page eight, they talk about drawing out, taking measurements, things from 
the site, how to, once you have that, start to think about what you might be doing with capturing water in your dry stream bed or infiltration basin, and then drawing out all of your plants to scale and making your plant list. One thing to note though, is that this assumes a slightly smaller landscape. So here they mentioned that, so standard graph paper, uh, the square is gonna be a quarter inch. Sometimes graph papers or custom ones or special ones have smaller, but standard is just gonna be a quarter inch square. And here they recommend uh, using a quarter inch to represent one foot. What we find for a lot of the suburban landscapes in our area, if you're looking at uh, 1,000 square feet, 1,500 square feet, or maybe even more, that what works best is getting an 11 by 17 pad of graph paper. Uh, you can often find those at, at like a place like Michael's. Uh, there's not a lot of real art supply stores around here, or it's something you can easily order online, 11 by 17 graph paper with quarter inch square. And with that, if you do each square is two feet in each direction, that will really uh, cover the vast majority of the uh, front yard and backyard landscapes that we see in our more suburban areas. You can always take your largest measurement in each direction and then figure out from there what's going to be your best scale. But once you have that, you can kind of work with, again, once you draw your base map, can work with tracing paper. So get an 11 by 17 pad of tracing paper and then really work through different ideas and get your exact plant counts. If you are up for that, that will let you order your plants or go buy your plants with confidence. Make sure you have your exact plant counts. Now I also know and have worked with a number of gardeners where they just aren't interested in doing the measurements, doing that exact drawing. They like to work more intuitively. So if that's you, then that's uh, just fine. And what you can do is you can work with that plant list that you have and then spend time out on your site really picturing things. If you're someone who is a new gardener and you're not gonna draw it to scale, what I recommend is if you go to a landscape supply store, specialty supply store, you can get the little irrigation uh, marker flags. They're these come in packs of a hundred. Uh, they'll cost you 10 bucks to get a pack of a hundred. They're basically on a, uh, a rigid wire and it's a little plastic flag like you might see them at construction sites and you can write on those with sharpies and so you can kind of put those around your yard where you think you're going to put different plants and kind of lay it out uh, just on the site and build your exact plant counts from there it's another alternative option of how to do things i saw that joel typed in that michael's doesn't have the 11 by 17 graph paper but he got it at staples so thank you i think i, I got it at michael's in the past, but it's been quite a long time. So uh, you might check Staples as well. Uh, Staples, I think you can check their stock online as well. You can always call the store before you make the trip down there. Uh, and so just continuing that example, here is uh, my front yard. So I do this a lot. So I tend to work with a computer program. So this is the exact scaled plan for the front yard. So getting to that refined uh, version of it where these initials are equal to different species of plants. And so here was the landscape when we moved in. It's kind of patchy lawn. Here was it in January. And our approach, once this lawn was mostly dead, relied on getting the plants in the ground and then using a technique called sheet mulching with cardboard to create a biodegradable weed barrier. And we'll look more at that in the next section. And so you can see here, this is March 10th. So, so this is not my ideal planting period. We moved in just around Halloween and my partner and I, like I mentioned, are both professional horticulture people. So we were not going to be watering the lawn all the way until the next fall, uh, but also, didn't want to leave the lawn abandoned. And so we kind of really hustled to get things in at what I would consider the one of like the last acceptable uh, weeks, definitely the last acceptable month for me for the uh, tail end of, I won't even say ideal, but acceptable planting season. So here you can see the rough planting density with our layout. Getting going on planting, here's the open trench from the French drain. And so here it is, March 14th, plants are in the ground. Again, that's the stage where you think this is really nothing. It's gonna take forever to grow in. Here is mulch being 
delivered. And this is mulch for a large backyard as well. So you won't need a pile of mulch this big for just a front yard. And then working with recycled and scavenged cardboard boxes, layering them with a nice overlap to form that biodegradable weed barrier, just enough to smother the weeds, let the new plants grow, it's permeable to water. And after a year or so, depending on the amount of moisture underneath the wood chips, it's just going to turn to compost and be totally gone. So here it is at approximately two months. So just kind of slowly rooting in, starting to grow a little bit, little bit of color. Here's that French drain getting filled in, still had a lot more work to do with the rocks, kind of making it look more natural, but this is a project that just taking on a bit at a time over the weekend when we had the time. So it wasn't necessarily one huge push other than the, the planting day. Uh, and you can see the irrigation has been retrofit. We'll talk a little bit more about that towards the end of the class. And so starting to grow in and so planted in March, and you can see here, August of that year, you know, even though it looked like the plants would take forever to grow in at approximately five months, just kind of noticed uh, one day looking at the screen door, there's still a lot of growing to do. Everything is small, so you can't really see the design intent yet, but it's much more green than brown. You don't really see much of the mulch anymore, which again is part of the design. I like to design pretty full looking landscapes. If, if there's just a lot of open mulch in one plant here or there, over time, that's going to still be a lot of weeds that'll want to grow there. But with a pretty grown in landscape, uh, it becomes a lot less maintenance. And so here it is at that five months, starting to have more color. You can still see in the back with the larger shrubs, the smaller stuff grew in quickly, it was placed closer together. More the back with the larger shrubs. This is going to be one of our trees, but it was planted from a tiny little thing. So it's grown quite a bit. And, you know, at about six months, starting to have some nice color, starting to have evidence of native pollinators. So this is our Western redbud tree. And these cuts like this are a native, what's called a leaf cutter bee that harvests from the edges of the leaves, doesn't harm the plant at all. And they use those to create uh, their nests. We got our yard certified as a wildlife habitat, which is something you can do to kind of get the sign, support the National Wildlife Federation. You make a small donation, they give you the sign. Also lets the neighbors kind of know what you have going on. And so you self-report, but if you design your yard to have sources of food, water, cover, and places to raise young. So basically a diversity of kind of shrub, maybe a tree, uh, physical structure where, where the, mostly in our areas, it's gonna be birds. Uh, can have cover in places to raise young, then you can get that certification. And everything moved in. So August of that year had a hummingbird, which pretty much decided that the, the front yard was her house and would sit on that twig, uh, that dried grass flower. Literally every morning I would see her for a number of months that summer and would sit there and then eat little insects and chase away the other hummingbirds. And it truly is with that wildlife habitat. If you build it, they will come. So starting to grow in and no matter how much, you know, you always lose. If you plant a whole garden, you'll always lose a couple of plants. That's just, they're living things. That's just the case. And so if that happens, don't, don't beat up on yourself too much. Reflect back, you know, was it the right plant, right place? This ended up being an area where for this plant, which is a great and tough plant, the microclimate right next to the driveway was just a little too hot. And so we replaced it with, with a different species of plant. Uh, happens, every site is different. And so you just learn from it and move on. And so here it is at approximately six months, you know, starting to grow in and getting these nice moments of juxtaposition of the different colors and forms of the plants. Had another delivery of mulch for the backyard at 13 months. So standing on top of that, taking the picture of the landscape growing in. So again, a lot more growing to do from the trees, but starting to get that sense of the design and these really beautiful moments in this native front yard garden. And so that's just one example. Again, your aesthetic might be much more formal. Uh, you might want less plant density, but just one example of how things really do uh, get going. And then kind of balancing as we planned, one thing I didn't talk about is, is balancing the, 
color throughout the year and, the, and with the flowers that's also uh, important food source for pollinators and butterflies and so here it is in April with our spring color and then as that fades we have a whole kind of course of other stuff that comes in as uh, summer comes in so just one example and if you want to get deeper into that and more thoughts about how to look at plants and the forms of plants and the structure i'd encourage you to check out either our do-it-yourself landscape design online workshop recording or our california native garden design online workshop recording or join us in the spring for the live versions of those and so with that now gonna look at some questions and then we will kind of conclude by looking at some basics of turf removal and uh, irrigation conversion and some additional resources for those. So some questions that have come in uh, from Whitney. Source for the suggestions for the branches or logs used in the front yard. So we had to have some pretty severe tree work done when we moved in for the backyard. So those were just all saved by telling the arborists uh, not to grind them up and that we would use them. Uh, but my main suggestion would be, I don't think you're going to find a place where you can buy things like that, but uh, tree trimmers working in your neighborhood, or if you uh, know of anyone getting tree work done in their yard, uh, just kind of uh, scavenging it uh, would be my only suggestion. And then uh, also from Whitney, any sort of suggestions for affordable, free, larger stones, mulch, or dirt? Uh, so in my example, all of those stones were actually ones that we, uh, for the larger ones, were ones that we dug up from the yard as we were digging our dry stream bed in the back. Uh, depends on where you live. I would say uh, friends would be the easiest place, like for people who live around where we are. If you have any friends in Rancho Cucamonga, there's chances are that there might be a pile of rock at the side of their yard somewhere, and they might be very happy for you to take it. Uh, Occasionally, I've known people where, uh, you know, construction sites in our area and some of the areas closer to the foothills, they'll have large piles of rocks. Uh, occasionally, I've known people who have uh, for for smaller construction sites done by smaller crews have uh, gotten permission to, to take the stones. Uh, sometimes you do have to pay by the pound and work with the landscape supply company. If you are local to this area uh, on our website where you can download the PDF of the slides of this presentation, that's cbwcd.org slash presentations. There's also a list of local landscape suppliers you can download, and there are yards where you can get stone as well. Uh, dirt uh, sources, you're gonna have to keep your eyes open. Sometimes you see, you might check Craigslist. You know, sometimes you do see advertisements for free uh, fill dirt because somebody is like digging a swimming pool or something like that. So it, it does come around. And then mulch, uh, you might want to check out a, there's an app called Chip Drop, C-H-I-P-D-R-O-P, where you can register. And if you can take like a whole large truckload of mulch at once, it's basically an app that connects tree trimmers who might be working in your neighborhood with people who have a space and are willing to let a whole truckload of mulch be dropped. But you kind of, the quality can be variable because uh, it just depends on what they are cutting up and grinding their particular equipment. And you're gonna have to be able to receive a whole large load of mulch. If you happen to be local to our area, uh, we do have a free mulch and compost giveaway program currently in our parking lot in Montclair at the Waterwise Community Center. Uh, in our parking lot, we just have a big pile of mulch and a big pile of compost, and people are welcome to come with their own tools and fill up either bins or the back of a pickup truck and you know show up whenever you want and take it. We just ask people to wear masks and to social distance when they're doing that, but usually there's no more than one or two people at a time. So it depends how much you need, depends where you are. Some cities, depending on where you are, do have free mulch giveaway programs. They're usually similar where they'll have a big pile somewhere, either throughout the year or at different times, and you can come uh, load it yourself. And I do see that uh, someone has their hand up. Uh, if you weren't at the beginning of the program, if your hand is up on purpose, uh, because of technical reasons, we don't call on people, but feel free to type your question into the question and answer and 
will answer it. Uh, probably at this point, the next time I will stop because the time is at the end of the class. And so we've talked a good amount about design, but before you can get to the fun planting part, first you need to get your lawn out if you have a lawn. So turf removal is essential. It's one of the most underestimated parts of the process if you do have a lawn. If this is something you're going to be taking on yourself, I highly, highly encourage you to use this as a beginning, but to also check out our full workshop recording on our YouTube site called Removing Your Lawn the Right Way. There will be many, many more tips and tricks and fuller, more in-depth coverage of the different methods, which if you're actually going to be doing this, I would consider essential. We just don't have enough time to cover all of this in the depth, and you're going to be spending a lot of time and effort on doing it, so you want every tip and trick that we can provide you. And so here is part of why it is so essential. One main thing to identify is the general type of turf you have. You don't need to know the species, but the general type of turf you have. And then if you have one of those critical, really more difficult to deal with weeds. And the reason why is because the different type of turf you have will have a direct bearing on how hard it is to truly kill your turf. Because the funny thing about turf is that when you want it to grow lush and be beautifully green, parts of it want to die. But once you finally want it to completely die, parts of it are gonna to wanna to keep growing back, especially with your young, even if it's a water-wise landscape, you're going to be probably watering pretty deeply once a week the first year to get things established. And that will be enough for certain turf types to try to grow back and they'll potentially be all up in the roots of your new plants. And so the easiest, time to deal with it is when you are trying to take it all out at once, not when you have a new garden growing in. If you have cool season turf grass, that's going to be like a tall fescue type grass. It's often if you have someone put in sod or reseed a lawn in Southern California, it's often what the, the goal is. If you have beautiful cool season grass and only cool season grass, that's great news. That's the type of lawn that really, really doesn't want to grow in Southern California. It looks the luscious and even in green all year long, but almost just with cutting off the water for long enough, you could kill it. So that's great. But the reality is no matter what you started with, most of us in Southern California have between some and almost all Bermuda grass. It's the kind of stringy stuff. It's the area where if you have otherwise a green lawn in the middle of winter, some patches, no matter how much water there is, might turn brown. It's because it goes dormant in the middle of winter. Or if it's all Bermuda grass, you know, it might look like this in the coldest part of the year. It's super tough. It doesn't require that much water. Uh, it requires a lot of water to stay perfectly evenly green, but to survive, it can go dormant you can stop watering it and it can turn brown and look dead. But as soon as the water comes back, enough of it will come back and start growing. And it's really hard to kill. Its roots can be a foot deep. Like in this picture here, it would have roots underneath concrete that can kind of grow back in. It really takes some work to get rid of. And part of the reason why is because it can grow and propagate itself either from seeds or from stolons, which are stems that creep along the soil surface and reroot, or from any bit of the root that's left as well. And so we'll talk about different techniques, but really getting a hold of your Bermuda grass, which because it's naturally dormant in the middle of winter, the spring through summer when it's actively growing is going to be your best time to take care of it. It's not something you want to underestimate. If you have a lot of Bermuda grass and you think, oh, it looks mostly dead, or you take out you know, the top like inch of it and the roots and you don't thoroughly remove the roots or you don't smother it somehow, it will come back. Uh, and I've seen a lot of projects, a lot of people have a lot more difficulty than they should have had because they rushed through the more boring part of the turf removal too quickly and didn't do a thorough enough job on the Bermuda grass. And then if you remove your lawn and what you see starting to come back is something that might 
look like it blends in just at the beginning, but you can see it's actually more individual little plants. If they start to go to seed, they almost look like a little papyrus. They have a kind of shinier leaf than grass. That might be nut sedge. And that's one that you really want to deal with as well. Uh, it, same thing, it, it likes water, but even just that once a week deep watering that you would give that first year starting to get established water-wise plants that you might water less over time will be enough for it to grow if you have it. And it's called nut sedge because after it gets even just this big, it grows all these little nuts, which if the main plant is pulled, can re-sprout. And so what you're gonna to wanna to do is either smother it with cardboard, like that sheet mulching technique. Some of it will still pop through and just keep pulling it and keep pulling it. But if you don't do anything, it will continue to spread. So we're gonna briefly look at some different turf removal methods. And again, if you're gonna choose one of these, take a look at that full workshop and really learn the tips and tricks for it. This is really just to introduce you to the techniques. First one, and this is kind of my go-to, is called sheet mulching or cardboard mulching. It's using, again, that scavenged cardboard, nicely overlapped to create that biodegradable weed barrier. Here is an example of a turf removal project that I was involved with in Pomona. And so in this case, the owner of the property uh, had a company that installed solar panels. And so we we're able to get those solar panel boxes really easily, which are great. The larger the boxes you have, the faster it goes, the fewest overlaps. Uh, appliance boxes are a good way to go. I know people who have scavenged them from like local auto body repair shops. They're bringing in bumpers and things like that in huge cardboard boxes sometimes, and they need to pay to dispose of them. They're small businesses. Uh, so going somewhere that's gonna be accumulating cardboard boxes is a good way to go. Uh, I order uh, food and litter for my cats online. So we end up using a lot of the shipment boxes that those come in in our yard. I also have an ongoing uh, deal with a contractor who lives a block away from me who installs a lot of kitchens. He knows if he has big cardboard boxes, which he does when he gets you know kitchen cabinets, he can always leave them in a spot in my driveway and I'll always use them. So I kind of accumulate them that way. So however you're gonna do it, you would accumulate cardboard boxes. And then what you wanna do is you wanna water really deeply ahead of time. And then you lay out your cardboard boxes. Here, we combined a couple of techniques. This was a small enough yard and it was mostly Bermuda grass that we actually roughed out as much of the grass as we could ahead of time. If you have a large yard, that might not be an option. And then you can see here first doing the pathway, lining, we decided to line that what would be a gravel pathway with rocks and then doing the outer area and then if you have large boxes, uh, wetting, even though you've already wet the soil underneath, wetting the boxes well, gets them to kind of slump down and conform to the landscape, and then putting your mulch layer on top of that. So here's our wood chip mulch here. And then we added our gravel to our pathways and then planted into it. Depending on the size of your boxes, if you have those large boxes, which is ideal, you'll do that first. And then you'll use a blade, like an old uh, serrated steak knife is, is one thing that'll work fine or an old like bread knife or something like that, something that's serrated to cut holes in the cardboard and then install your plants. If you are using uh, smaller boxes, you might plant first and then kind of tile them around. If you are using this as your primary way of killing the turf, you want to lay down the sheet mulch and then the top layer of mulch during the active growing season of that turf. So if it's that cool season turf, that'll be year round. If it's the Bermuda grass and it's the middle of winter and it's already brown and dormant, you're gonna to need to give it some extra time, but you'd wanna lay it down and ideally wait like eight weeks for the grass to kind of rot and not have access to the sun underneath before you plant. So depending on what techniques you use or if you combine, uh, different techniques would kind of give you a guideline for how you would structure your project around it. If you just don't have access to that cardboard, which is the best way to go, you can use rolls of painter's paper that you get from the hardware store. You can usually get them in different widths. You want to go the widest, which is three feet. Always want to get the plain brown. They'll have a red one too, which it has a rosin in it, which is a semi-waterproof barrier. Great if you spill paint on a floor, not good in your landscape if you're trying to make sure your new plants get water. So the plain brown paper. And then you're gonna to wanna to have a nice good 
uh, six to ideally like nine inch overlap and ideally use at least a couple of layers. Uh, it won't last as long as the cardboard. If you're doing a large yard, the cost can add up surprisingly quickly where the cardboard might be free. So it's not ideal, but it's easy to just go and pick up what you need. Uh, it's not as effective as cardboard for Bermuda grass, but if you just have general weeds or mostly dead lawn, then it might uh, be just fine. I normally will use it for just kind of general weedy areas uh, after like maybe cutting back the weeds hard with a string trimmer and not as much for Bermuda grass. The Bermuda grass will always, some of it will sneak its way through the overlaps and come back. You just really want to be on patrol for it when that next spring comes pull it out as soon as it comes up, stay on top of it, and you will beat it. If you don't do anything, it slowly will get on top of it. It'll spread through the mulch and it can take back over even with this stuff. So it still takes that responsibility to keep an eye out uh, for my yard, which like all my neighbors have Bermuda grass. I had all Bermuda grass with that sheet mulching. Kind of first year, it was like five to 10 minutes, you know, once a week after things got growing again for the grass was what we we're able to do. And now in year two, it's like 15 minutes of pulling weeds, maybe 20 uh, once a month during the warm season and less other times than that. You really just like a few times a year, but the difference between doing it, staying on it and not doing it all is huge. I don't recommend the black plastic weed fabric, even though it claims that it's permeable to air and water and it's designed that way. It's very popular with contractors because it is a quick and easy solution to get things done like in a couple of days. If it worked as advertised long term, I'd have no problems with it. But the reality is that it might work for a few years. But over time, this is pretty much what will always happen. Over time, as the top layer, the mulch layer breaks down, the air and water, it, it, the, the little pore spaces get clogged up. It's less permeable to air and water. The natural cycling of that organic matter as that mulch would break down is cut off. Weeds start to grow on top of that weed barrier. So you have to weed anyways, and it starts to break apart. So then you're pulling out chunks of plastic trash from your landscape for the next five to 10 years. Uh, it just doesn't work as advertised, and I wish it did but it doesn't, so it's just not a good long-term solution. Uh, next possible method that's popular is solarization. If you are interested in this, it has to be done in the height of summer because it's basically steam sterilizing the top four to six inches of your soil. We will kill grass, roots, anything else in your soil. Uh, earthworms are able to go deeper down and come back up. It will kill both beneficial and non-beneficial, so pathogenic soil microorganisms, but the good guys tend to come back faster than the bad guys. It just fries everything. And the way to accomplish this is it needs to happen over eight weeks at least, if not 10, in the middle of the high season uh, of summer. So we're talking like June, July, August, early September. Water the lawn really well ahead of time. You need to have soil moisture because you're basically steam sterilizing laying down clear plastic sheeting from the hardware store in the widest widths possible, and then weighing it down either with like those metal staples for holding down drip irrigation for pots filled with soil, bricks, uh, lumber is probably what's tucked into here, making sure that wind can't get through because it needs to be tight. Uh, if wind gets through, you won't build up that heat and the combination of the clear plastic, the soil moisture and the direct sun will fry everything including plant roots. So it's not something you want to do right at the base of a tree where the roots will get out into it. I wouldn't do it this close to that shrub. Personally, I would be concerned. If you have a tree, you might need to combine. So here's like a combination of the sheet mulching with the cardboard, probably maybe the, the paper. And then the outer layers have the plastic and it'll just fry everything. Uh, clear plastic sheeting in the four mil or six mil thickness Four mil is ideal, a little bit thinner, you'll get more heat gain from the hardware store. They'll have it on the shelf in the paint section, but you can also look online if you have a large area, the wider widths sometimes are like a special order free ship to the store kind of thing. And you want the least amount of seams to deal with. So you'll want to get, you know, you can order something like a 10 foot roll, which comes folded over. So it's not like a 10 foot wide box. 
uh, rather than you know like a, a four foot roll or something like that. Uh, so that's solarization. And again, some Bermuda grass will be rooted deeper and will grow back, but you'll just be right on top of it. And then method number three is just physically digging it up and removing it. If you only have the cool season turf, renting a sod cutter, and basically it's like sod in reverse, is a viable way to go. Bermuda grass is going to be so much deeper than that, that the only reason to do this would be if you're physically trying to get the soil a little bit lower quickly, but I would still follow up even sod cutting with at least that paper sheeting if you have Bermuda grass, because there'll be a lot of roots deeper down. The cost of disposing this can add up very quickly and be surprisingly expensive. In that full turf removal workshop, we have a kind of case study example of that. For most of us, it would be just kind of digging it out one chunk at a time with a shovel. You want to shake off as much soil as possible. That's the really hard part to dispose of and really heavy. And then just the organic part uh, could be slowly green bin kind of one week at a time. This technique is best for small yards and people with like overactive teenagers at home who need something to, uh, you know, use their energy. Uh, and again, even with that, some can grow back. So you might combine this with like at least that paper sheeting, just depending on the grass species that you have. Also in that workshop, kind of some tips and tricks on how to chunk out a little bit of that uh, grass at a time. And then the final method that is often used by professional landscapers, sometimes by homeowners is herbicide. I can't in good conscience encourage you to use herbicide. The main herbicide that's used is Roundup or an off-brand label, but using glyphosate, which is the same active component. Uh, basically, uh, you know, at, at the level of the corporations, they're still debating whether or not it is carcinogenic. Uh, it has been categorized by the World Health Organization as a likely carcinogen, and there have been many lawsuits regarding uh, cancer being caused by this herbicide, which is the main one that's used to the users. Uh, some of those people have won huge settlements and Bayer, the main company that makes it, has recently proposed, and it sounds like it's gonna be rejected, an $11 billion settlement to help control the costs of the lawsuits because they think that they are going to be liable for more. So if you are going to use this stuff, realize that that it is serious stuff. For a long time, it was uh, kind of advertised as safe and, and perceptions on that are largely changing. If you still decide to use herbicide, I do feel like I need to mention uh, some important kind of notes because if you just go to a landscape supply store or a hardware store and say, I have Bermuda grass, what do I do? This is what they're gonna hand you. So I'm not encouraging it. I really prefer the other methods, but if you're still gonna use herbicide, make sure you research and wear proper personal protective equipment. Minimally, that's gonna be shoes, long pants, long sleeves, uh, glasses. Uh, I would highly encourage you to wear you know, rubber gloves. Do not spray when it's breezy or windy. It will carry, which will mean you will inhale more. And also like roses are super sensitive. If even a little bit blows onto your neighbor's roses, they will not be happy with you. Uh, know that even when you do all of that, just like all the other methods, Bermuda grass will still come back. And it's not like you'll just be able to spray it once for Bermuda grass. The, the like common procedure for it would be to spray it when it's actively growing thoroughly, uh, you can't get water on it in 48 hours or it might not absorb correctly. Then it needs to be irrigated pretty well for another two weeks, sprayed again. Oftentimes you'll have to do that three or four times for complete control of Bermuda grass. Some will still grow back eventually. And so once you're talking about you know two months or more, that's the same time frame it's gonna to take to properly do the sheet mulching or the solarization. So, you know, that's, not that much of an advantage. Uh, and it's also generally not effective just, for example, on nut sedge or ivy if you have that and you're trying to get rid of it. And then transitioning from that to the other kind of thing that people often don't think about as they're getting excited about the plants and irrigation is that you're probably gonna make, need to make changes for your irrigation system. 
to get that turf replacement rebate, you definitely need to make changes to like a standard spray turf irrigation system. But if you have typical lawn sprinklers, even if it's a really great lawn sprinkler system, they're not gonna pop up any more than four inches. And so when you put in this beautiful, diverse, multi-layered new landscape, what would happen is that the pop-up sprinklers would shoot way too much water into the closest plant right next to it that's blocking the stream and everything else is gonna be way too dry. And I've seen people put in that whole new landscape and not catch that. And then a lot of the plants start dying, some from too much water, mostly from too little water. And so you're going to need to make some changes. There's a couple of good options. We have a ton of online resources about this. There is a class on our YouTube channel called Retrofitting Turf Irrigation Systems for California Native and Waterwise Gardens, all about this. And then with that, we have a number of supplemental how-to videos that follow me kind of step-by-step step as I'm showing you like literally how to make the cuts and put together the parts. Uh, there's also a whole a playlist that has all of that stuff together on the retrofitting turf irrigation systems playlist on our main YouTube channel. But all of that is, is all those individual videos as well are on the workshop playlist. And so you can retrofit your spray system to have those sprays be taller and go over the existing or the new plant material. And we'll look at that. You can install a professional style inline drip grid system. Those are really the two good options. There's also lots of bad options. Options for drip irrigation that are too quick and really, really cheap to install often don't support the plants well long-term. They're not durable and there's no point in putting in a cheap and easy drip irrigation system if three years later your plants are dying because it's not supporting the long-term health of your plants. You're not going to save money in the long run necessarily. So it, these are, are those kind of common, very common, uh, cheap solutions that don't support our water-wise plants well over time. They pretty much always fall apart. We have a program in our local area where we go to people's landscapes, uh, meet them at their house and look at their irrigation systems and provide advice. We have never seen this style of system when we do those audits uh, fully functional. Something has always fallen apart that throws off the pressure in the system. Something's getting overwatered, something's getting underwatered. And in addition to that, with these systems, these have usually one or two little drippers right at the base of the plant which is great when the plant is just put in the ground. But over time, when our water-wise plants grow, the roots want to go far and wide. The base of that plant wants to stay pretty dry. And nobody ever moves those things. And technically, what you would be doing is adding more and more and more over time. So you might have like 30-something of these things underneath the tree. Nobody does that. So after, you know, once you get to your three, four, five, plants start dying really often with these systems. So that's just like one common example of the kind of things we see with them. So what we would recommend are ways to retrofit a spray system where you would add what, what I mentioned before, these high efficiency rotating nozzles where in it, instead of that just kind of misting spray, it's actually individual streams that rotate around. Some go closer, some go farther. And as they rotate, you get a very even watering where it's not blowing off or misting in the wind kind of landing who knows where, like a traditional spray nozzle. Different brands make them. A, a common one, for example, is a brand called Hunter. They make something called the MP Rotator. It's probably the most common one, but Rainbird and Toro, all the main brands make them. And so this is my front yard. These were there in all the pictures that you saw. You may or may not have noticed them. And so disadvantage is that you see them. Advantage is that it's very easy, if you happen to have the right layout, to turn these on every once in a while, make sure nothing's broken. They're very kind of tough, resilient systems. Uh, they don't break as much as drip irrigation. And actually some of the birds that little, hunt little gnats and things like that like to perch on these. So I don't really mind having them around. Once the garden starts growing in, they're there if you look at them, but you don't really even notice them. And you want to make sure that they're installed, which is how all irrigation systems should be installed, so that each one kind of sprays all the way towards hitting the middle of the next stream so that they overlap, that evens them out. Uh, if your Enscape is set up to where it's more like that, uh, this is your opportunity to fix it. And in that workshop that we have online, we go through looking at that and how to add a head here or there if you need to fix the spacing and all of that. So that's one option. 
I like that option for bigger landscape areas that don't have like big shrubs right at the edge where there's room for, for those sprinklers to shoot in. Uh, they're very low maintenance systems. If you're gonna be looking at drip irrigation, the, that's a great option as well. The kind of drip irrigation that I will always recommend is what's called inline drip tube. And so here it's instead of those individual little button emitters on the little tube, each one of these emitters is already embedded inside of this line at a standard spacing, usually a foot. You can order them at other spacings as well. And they're not just a hole. They're actually a highly engineered little thing that balances out the pressure and makes sure the exact same amount of water goes out on each one at the same time. And essentially what you're doing is laying this out in a grid, which is gonna be spaced out specifically for your soil type. There's a guide, we go over this in that full workshop for how far apart you should space things and what emitters you should get. Kind of you buy it by the tube with the emitters already in, but what specifications for the flow rate. And as this grid expands and things widen out as it goes through the soil, essentially you're getting full coverage to the root zone as if it had rained through the full root zone area, watering the plants where they want to get water kind of far and wide, but it's just not going through the air. So it's highly accurate in terms of where it goes. In a large landscape like this, and I've installed you know, plenty of landscapes like this, uh, if you have a lot of larger shrubs, things that would block the sprays, this is a good way to go. It's a lot more material to put out at the beginning, but this is a resilient system that will last and keep your landscape healthy over time as long as you then water the appropriate amount at the appropriate timing. Where those just one or two buttons at just at the base of the plants, that's not going to support your plant well long-term. For small plantings like this, uh, I'll, I'll always use drip irrigation. Those sprays are just always gonna overspray, waste a lot of water, go into the parking lot. For a larger landscape, I'll often do those high efficiency sprays if the planting design layout works that way. Sometimes as things start to grow and you need to move the sprays or even put them on a taller uh, riser, or if the, the design is more complex with too many different heights, I will use drip. And if you have pathways or areas like that, you know those can be skipped. There's different ways of installing, uh, but this is the style that I always recommend if you're gonna be working with drip irrigation kind of the only way to go. And so in that full workshop, we'll work a little bit through using, again, the same front yard that we looked at the design example of. Uh, we'll look through how to kind of analyze the existing spray system, how to think about where, if you're retrofitting a spray system, where you might need to move your sprinklers to have it be more highly efficient, how to put them on those solid risers step-by-step, step, how to add in a sprinkler here or there if you need to, and then in this case, you know, also looking at with this hedge that we put in over here, right now, the sprinklers are still spraying over the old hedge from there, but eventually we're gonna move these sprinklers over to the other side, probably in another year or so, when this hedge of these tough native plants is more well-established, should be able to just rely on the water from this side, and then it won't block the sprays long-term. So even with the sprays, you need to kind of, Continue to be aware of your landscape. If things start to be blocked, you might need to move something here or there. And we'll teach you how to do that in that workshop. Also looking at, for examples, if you wanted to take a design like this and convert it to drip, different examples for that. If you're putting in drip irrigation, you are always going to need to have some sort of filter and pressure reducer. We go way into that in that workshop as well. So I know it's a little bit after 8.30. Thank you for sticking with us. We are almost done. There's just so many important things to cover to really make sure that you are getting off on the right foot. So sometimes we do go a little bit over, but should be done in just a few minutes and then I'll have plenty of time for any additional questions. As a way to start to conclude, I just wanna review the order of things. Uh, make sure that you're, you're looking at things in the right order of operations. So really starting with your goals, your site observations, reflecting on your budget, figuring out your design. As soon as you have your design, if you're going to be working with a contractor, talk to multiple contractors, get quotes, check their references, get on their schedule if uh, you're going to be working with them. I try to get on their schedule for the ideal time of the year. Also, as soon as you have your design, depending on 
if you're going to be working with the contractor or not, you can turn in your turf replacement application. Remember, you only have 180 days if you're doing that turf replacement rebate. So if your contractor is going to be starting in you know, six months, you might want to wait for a while. If you go to that website, there literally is a dial showing the amount of funds remaining. And most of the funds were still remaining. It was around 50%. And it's taken a couple of years to get down to 50%. So I can't promise, but chances are, you know, there's still going to be quite a while where that funding is going to be available. Moving forward from there, after you get your approval, if you're doing that rebate, you're going to kill your turf, prepare your site, move your soil, kind of if you need to dig your dry stream beds, you know, build mounds, anything like that, uh, build pathways, you can start doing that. If you have that Bermuda grass, it should be done in the summer, ideally. Spring, early fall, while things are actively going. Then you're going to want to do your primary irrigation system work. If you're doing, you know, digging trenches, putting pipes in, all of that sort of stuff. If you have an existing turf irrigation system in good conditions, you can probably cap most of those if you're putting in drip and adapt from there. So you might not have a lot of primary irrigation system work. You're going to have to put in some sort of pressure regulation. Again, we talk about all of that in that full workshop. Or if you are sprinklers are in the right place, you might only need to add uh, those adapters for that improved spray system. But whatever it is, you're going to be figuring that out, doing all or most of that work. Planting will go after that. Any final irrigation system work that's necessary, sometimes the very last parts of drip systems are put in right after planting, but kind of over the same weekend. So just depending on how you're planning that out, then you're going to be mulching, cleaning up, final touches, and maybe a little bit of final you know, rock work. And then from there, you're moving into your first year of establishment care and enjoying watching your garden grow in. Another workshop, if you're going to be taking this on yourself, that I would highly recommend, especially if you're a first time gardener doing this, is there is an installation and establishment of Waterwise and California Native Landscapes workshop, where we show kind of planting a plant, laying out the project site, lots of good tips and information on there. So I really encourage you again, protect your investment, invest the time and take a look at that workshop. Uh, and that should help you out quite a bit. So to conclude with some final design thoughts, remember that uh, in considering this all, in addition to a beautiful garden, you can have your garden give back to the environment by providing for those needs of birds, lizards, pollinators, by having a variety of plants, ideally native plants that bloom throughout the year. And don't cut off the seed heads too soon when you uh, when your plants bloom, if you're working with native plants, let those seeds kind of dry out and develop after the flowers fade. They can actually be quite beautiful. And then when you cut them back, leave some of them in the garden and you'll have some different birds that'll come and, and pick through uh, in the mulch layer and provide some source of water, like a bird bath or something like that. And you'll have things come around. Because this is a low water garden, some artificial turf, uh, a couple of sago palms and just a few plants here or there but it doesn't provide shelter for anyone, not for the wildlife. It's not really a sheltering, welcoming landscape for the people who live there. This is a more kind of wild looking landscape, but this provides tons of shelter for local wildlife, especially as some of the larger you know, trees will grow in as well. And this is a landscape that was put in as a DIY project and the family that lives there with their young kid spends lots of time out in this small landscape on the way to school, coming home, every day kind of seeing what's changing throughout the year, seeing who shows up in the garden, the different flowers coming and going. That's a landscape that really does a lot more than the landscape it replaced. And if you want it to be a calmer aesthetic, you can do that too, but still accomplish all the main things. And also remember that our landscapes and gardens are human habitat. So don't forget as you start researching plants to remember to have places to sit and enjoy it all and a little bit of shade in Southern California as well. It's pretty important for comfort because our gardens are gonna seem easier to care for if they're comfortable spaces that we enjoy spending time in. And I do a lot of my garden work on the weekends, either in the morning with a cup of coffee and my pruners, or sometimes like in the fall on the nicer days, you know, with a, uh, a beer and uh, pruners as well, just spending time out there and doing stuff a little bit at a time and enjoying spending time in the garden. So nice places to be will really make them a lot of fun. And it doesn't need to cost an arm and a leg. 
you can work with uh, you know decent variety of shrubs. Uh, this is a landscape that I drove by in Pomona on a pretty busy street and started kind of counting plants. And you know it's definitely uh, designed by the homeowner, I would say, and uh, but accomplishes a lot. Smells great, provides some shade, makes the house feel a lot farther back from the street, and you know didn't cost a ton and would have cost less than the uh, the rebate amount if you, if they're all being planted from small sizes. So remember, it's always or often better to keep it simple, not too many different plants, well-researched, well-selected. And if you love a couple of higher water use plants, like here, put them in the right place, group them together. Everything else can be things that are really well-suited for where we are. Plenty of beauty and inspiration to be found with those choices. And so with that, thank you very much for spending the extra time with us. I hope you learned a lot and feel uh, like you have some good bearing in what you need to learn next and where to go from here. Uh, what I'm going to do is I am going to launch the closing poll. It's just a few questions, which really helps us out. We also always love to hear as we're always kind of refining our workshops, uh, anything that you thought was particularly useful or anything that you think wasn't covered well, uh, please let us know in the chat. And with that, I am going to start looking back through the questions and seeing any additional questions that came in and uh, go through those. So, uh, I already answered those. Okay. From Floor. I have a paradise in my backyard. Do I need to remove them or can I keep them? I'm assuming that you mean that bird of paradise plant. Uh, the bird of paradise are, they're not listed as low water plants, but in my experience, if they're well established, if they've been in for a while, I have done like low water conversions and left them and they are extremely tough and tend to do very well, even with lower water. And then if you need to, you can always uh, just give them a supplemental hose water and get between every once in a while if you want to. Uh, the smaller birds of paradise aren't too bad to get out, but I've I uh, like rented a place where we did a mostly California native backyard and had those giant birds of paradise, which are just super tough. Uh, we just left them in, didn't water them much, and they did fine. And they actually did have lots of birds that would drink the nectar out of those huge flowers. Uh, so from also from floor, I have a small yard. Are there options that could be a type of ground to step on for children? Absolutely. Uh, there are on the Inland Valley Garden Planner, there are on the helpful list, there's some turf alternatives there. You know, there's nothing other than turf that's gonna take like uh, soccer practice every day. But if you want kind of a looser meadowy kind of look that can still take foot traffic and playing in, uh, there are some options. They're not going to be the, the lowest, lowest, you know, only once a month water, but there are some options for like meadow grasses. There's one called Western Meadow Sedge that I really like that it would be no more than once a week water. I have a small patch of it in my garden and I water it now that it's established maybe twice a month in the summer and it does great. Uh, and it looks beautiful. It's this kind of longer meadowy grass, but it can be cut back as well and maintained more like a normal lawn. Uh, does rainwater retention and some plants attract mosquitoes? Uh, there are not plants that attract mosquitoes. The rainwater retention, one of the important things to do is with that, all you have to do is make sure that uh, with your drainage test, you can see how many inches of water are going to go down uh, per hour. And you just need to make sure that everything drains within 72 hours. It takes 72 hours for a mosquito larva to become a mosquito. And if the water drains before then, the larva just die. So it's, if everything drains within 72 hours, then uh, it's just physically can't create mosquito habitat. That's the key with bird baths as well, is just replace the water every day and you, you'll never have mosquitoes. And so in most cases, these things are only going to be uh, maybe a foot or a little bit more of standing water in them, even when they're full. And so in most cases, uh, 
you, you want to check your, especially if you have clay soil, you want to check your, your uh, infiltration rate ahead of time to make sure. But in most cases, that's going to drain uh, within a day or two at the absolute maximum. So you won't get mosquitoes. If, you're, it's, if it's kind of like a large industrial scale where it's uh, you know something that's really deep and fenced off, they need to worry about it more. But usually in front yards, it's not uh, deep enough. But you do need to worry about it with those rain barrels that are not going to be draining out, which is one of the reasons why I prefer it to be captured in the landscape. Uh, my child has special needs and is very afraid of flies, mosquitoes, and bees. Okay, that's understandable. Butterflies and birds are okay. Uh, so anything that flowers will attract bees that has like a typical flower. But one thing that uh, you could work with are there are many uh, low water grasses that you can look at on the Inland Valley Garden Planner. Some of them are native. There's some other really beautiful bunched grasses, so different sizes. Uh, from Texas that are pretty low water. Some of them certain times of year have really beautiful red or pink flowers. Some of them have like a bluish foliage, different kinds of textures and grasses uh, are actually wind pollinated. So they don't attract bees at all. And you can put together a, uh, a pretty beautiful garden using mostly just bunch grasses and then maybe that lower meadow grass uh, for that area. And then uh, and then the question, are there modern designs for types of water-wise yards? Absolutely. And so oftentimes modern designs will group things uh, in like blocks of the same plant, kind of maybe working in linear rows. And that modern designs do often use a lot of grasses and grass-like plants. So that could work very well. Uh, and I'm not sure where you live, Floor, but uh, if you are within our service area, uh, we could work with you as part of that program to, uh, to design a yard for you that does all of that. And then uh, last question I see in the Q&A, and then I'll look back in the chat from Reggie. Are there any plants that attract snakes? I don't like snakes. Uh, there are no specific plants that attract snakes. If you are in an urban area, uh, you know, these plants will not attract snakes. If you, you know, they're not snakes, they won't come there. If you are like right up in an urban wildland interface area where you back up to a wild area, the plants themselves won't attract snakes. However, if you do have like dense shrubbery, uh, it might be harder to see if the snakes are, you know, there. And so in that case, you might work with plants that are spaced a little bit farther apart and also kind of mixing in succulents that can have kind of more open look in between might be something that you might think about. However, you don't just want to go to like vast areas of rock and gravel with no plants or very few plants because those wide open areas of rock and gravel are actually those hot spaces that snakes do like to sun in. So having a right balance between plants, uh, some space in between, and just kind of keeping things a little bit more open might work. Uh, see, uh, so uh, follow-up question from Floor, to get the rebate, can you use a combination of gravel and pavers to give options for the children to step in? case of grass. So you do have to have some amount of plants. So remember, you have to have that minimum of three plants per hundred square feet. So you can have some areas definitely that have gravel and pavers if you want that as your patio space, as long as the total area you're getting the rebate for adds up to those three plants per hundred square feet. So it can be kind of like something like maybe the grass is off to the side and then a center patio space maybe of the pavers and gravel. You also want to make sure you have some amount of plants because if you're in Southern California and it's all pavers and gravel, that's going to be super hot and really unwelcoming and not a nice place to be during uh, a good amount of the year when it's warm. Looks like that is it. So, oh, no, a couple of other things. Oh, okay. Uh, yep, looks like that is it. So thanks for joining us. I hope you have a good evening. And if you have not already, please uh, sign up for our newsletter and check out the links for our other resources. All right, have a good evening, everybody.